ずに奪い全部二人かい目指すでは負けにたいかあの若い頃の気持ち踊り落とせたらよいのにもしよろしくねば Hello and welcome to Japanimation Station's Kyoto Vacation, an anime podcast brought to you by Sean Chapman and Jonathan Lack. We are here to kick back, relax, and talk about some anime this week on the show, bringing you a very emotional episode of our Kyoto Vacation because it is the last episode of our Kyoto Vacation. We are on the plane ride home. It's very awkward recording a podcast on the plane, but we decided we had to do it because we have one last episode because ending a podcast with 31 episodes. Uh, that would just be really awkward. We've got to get to this 32. And we've had a long, long, eventful vacation. And as has kind of become tradition now in Japan Mation Station, we want to take an opportunity at the end here to reflect on the journey we've taken along the way.、Um, all the memories we've made, all the friends we've made,、um, all the lessons about life that we have learned through our Kyoto vacation. And that's what today's episode is all about just reflecting back on everything we've done. How are you doing, Jonathan? I'm doing pretty good. I'm sad to leave Kyoto. We were there for so long. I don't even, I don't even remember what America is like. You know, I'm going to have to figure out how to use American money again. We've been using yen for so long. You know, I'm going to miss not having, you know, Kalpis to drink and being able to go to,、uh, you know, get karage at the convenience store. You know, it's going to be a bummer, but I'm going to do my best back here in America. I'm definitely going to miss Japanese public transit. It was so good. We don't really have that in America. It's too bad. But we are leaving Kyoto, and,、uh, but we are taking Kyoto animation in our hearts. And today we will be discussing all of that in the form of things like a giant tier list, because that's the best way to gauge art. Exactly, yes. We're going to discuss the shows. We're going to rank the shows. We're just going to have a fun time here today,、uh, just reflecting back on a very long season of Japan Animation Station. And at the end, if that isn't enticing enough, at the end of today's show, we will be telling you what's next for Japan Animation Station because we're going to have a couple of one off episodes and we're going to announce season five and season six of this podcast,、uh, basically the next you know, year or so or more of the show. So, we have some big plans that we're very excited to share.、Uh, so, stick around to the end. You're going to hear some, some big news about what's next in the world of Japan Animation Station. It is not Kyoto Animation Season 2, where we go back and do everything we missed. <laughs> that would be, we could do that. It might be fun. It would probably piss off some people who maybe wanted a little more variety. I, I'm, I'm doing it anyways. I'm, I'm not doing it on a <laughs> podcast, but I've got, I've got almost everything KyoAni has done now on Blu ray,、uh, including all the stuff we have not watched. Um, for the podcast. So I'm, I'm, my Kyoto vacation never ends. It's, it's, it's been Kyoto vacation for me since like 2012 or whenever I first watched Nichijou or Clanad or Lucky Star, whichever one of those ones, or Haruhi, all those ones I watched early on on my own.、I've, my whole life has been a Kyoto vacation.、Um, <laughs> as so, as so evidenced spe- by. Just、oh, a、yeah. second. Speaking of physical media, since you're just saying you own all the shows, I have one update from our Haruhi episode like a year ago, which、mm-hmm. is. I said then, and I had done a lot of research, and I also did this for my dissertation because I was writing about this. I was not aware of any physical media release of Haruhi that had season one in its shuffle broadcast order, the way it aired on Japanese TV with the episodes out of order, right? Yes. And I did finally find a physical media release that did this. Not in Japan. This is, I, I found this on eBay. This is the original Bandai Namco. 
collector's edition box set of Suzumi Haruhi, which is this like giant fold out thing that has the DVDs and then a special mini compartment where it has all the like CD singles in there for the different theme songs and character songs. Yeah. And I learned that the li- this is not the the standalone editions of these DVDs were one disc a piece and had it in the same order as the Japanese DVDs, which was starting with episode double zero, the Mikuru Asahina episode, the the fake movie they made, and then it went in uh, chronological order from there. That's how season one was put out on DVD in Japan. That's what these DVDs did, and they're, they're the same DVD covers and everything with noisy Ito's like cover art and everything. But volumes two, three, and four in this limited edition have a bonus disc that do that those three bonus discs together have the show in its broadcast order and it even includes the next episode previews in their proper place which aren't even on the modern blu-ray sets you can't even they're not even in the bonus features yep. um and those next episode previews are where kyon and haruhi argue about the order of the show and how it is airing and so I finally found this. I bought it for myself because I wanted to see it for myself and have it here. The DVDs of Haruhi also look better than the Blu-rays for season one because the upscale on those Blu-rays is awful. Uh, so I'm happy to own this. This is kind of cool. There you go. Wow, I, I had no idea. that you yeah. know, the, it, the codification, like I said, it never stops. It's, it's here with it us never stops. the whole time. This was basically, I was reviewing, uh, I'm going through and revising my dissertation, and I was reading the part I wrote on Haruhi, which includes some talk about the broadcast versus shuffle, or the shuffle order versus the, you know, season two order, and I was kind of double-checking my work on that there were no physical media releases, at least in America or Japan, that did this, and then I went and found this again on eBay, and I was like, oh my god, I kind of have to see this for myself to see if this is right, and it was, so that was kind of cool. That is very cool. Well, I've, I've been doing some reflecting. I, I looked through my Google Drive, Jonathan, because I was curious what was, like, for me, what was the starting point of our Kyoto vacation? Um, and I found the, a document that was, like, my proto-document <laughs> for my notes before I made, like, the proper one for the notes that I ended up sharing with you. And I created that document on May 12th, 2023 at 8.34 p.m. So that is officially for me. That was that's not when we were on Kyoto vacation. That's when I started the plan for Kyoto yes. vacation and started putting together all of my notes um, that ended up becoming the insanely gigantic um, document that was finished on June twenty first, twenty twenty three, when we recorded our first episode, um, which ended up being a, 20, a sixteen page document. Um, we started that in June. Oh my God! So it's been over yeah. a year just for record. It'll be under a year for the release of these episodes because it started in late October, twenty twenty three. But we went so we started recording in June twenty three and ended. Now it is August eighteenth, twenty three. That is wow. That's a long production for one yeah. season. <laughs> well, Jonathan, I started the planning of it at the tail end of the twenty two twenty three school year. We yes. recorded and released the show across the entirety of the 23 to 24 school year. Um, and then um, we are now recording this episode the weekend after the students for the 24, 25 school year have just come in. So I've had one week with my new batch of students. That's how long this has been. Yes. This is sort of it is an entire year plus a little bit at the beginning, a little bit extra at the end. Um, so it, it has been a big, crazy thing. And Jonathan, do you want to know how many hours we've done? Sure. Of of this is of episodes or of uh, anime we've watched. So this is all I do. Uh, not hours we watched. Oh God, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't yeah. look at that. Um, because this was an easy number to pull up. I just pulled up all of my wave files from my recordings and okay. put them all in a playlist that just added it all together for me, and that brings it out to ninety two point four hours. <laughs> Usually I'm the one coming up with these crazy stats for you, Sean. But yes, yeah. that sounds about right. Uh, does that And that includes all the Endless 8 episodes? I believe that, so. Okay. I believe so. <laughs> yeah. No, this has been a really long season. It's been a very fun season. It's the biggest project we've ever taken on consciously. I think the biggest project we ever took on unconsciously was Weekly Suit Gundam. But when we started that, we had no idea we would be doing all of Gundam. Yeah, that was going to be five episodes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then it was 60 in the end. This was, we knew was at least going to be like, I think the original plan was like 22 episodes. So we knew it was going to be long. It wound up getting even longer because Kyoto Animation and, you know, hell, I'll just say it right now. They're the best anime studio in Japan. I think we yeah. can say that now that we've watched all of this shit, you know, if, uh, if we were in 
a different era where like Studio Ghibli was more active, I think that would be a conversation, but then you would be doing a movie versus TV thing. But I think in terms of TV anime production, I, is there any contest? No, especially if you're looking at like like average quality in particular, yeah. um, because, you know, you have some studios that are huge that will put out a billion shows and some of them might be great, but a lot of them will be not so great. Um, but KyoAni, I mean, you know, there's a couple of shows that aren't like amazing, amazing. But even if you look at their worst shows, like there's still stuff about them that is so head and above everything else. Um, in terms of like visual production and things like that. And then the average quality, I mean, the number of raw masterpieces Kiwani has put out consistently um, over, you know, a decade plus, it's crazy. Yes. So I think there's no question in my mind that this, that Kiwani is the best and most prolific TV anime studio, TV animation studio in the world. Fuck Japan. Like oh, anywhere. yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. We're talking about anime, so I'm thinking about Japan, but you're right. I don't know who would even be in competition for that elsewhere in the world. Um, and I think so much of it is the stuff we've gotten to talk about throughout this season of meeting all of the people, getting a sense of, you know, the people who kind of came in having some of a, a history in this, like Tatsu Ishihara or, you know, Yasumoto Takahi uh, Takamoto Yasuhiro. Um, but then all the people who come up and became, you know, big deals like Yamada Naoko or Yamamura Takuya, who was mm -hmm. like, oh, who's this new guy directing episodes? And then eventually he's directing our favorite episodes of some of these shows, you know, and he has his own show, which we didn't review this season, but I'm sure he will go on to do many, many more things. And Haruka Fujita, who came out of the gate with her first movie being Violet Evergarden Gaiden, which is a pretty crazy movie to have as your first movie. Yeah. Um, it is it is so cool. You know, the opportunity to talk about so many more women in executive positions of these things than we usually get to talk about because most anime studios you know a lot of women will work there but they don't necessarily always get to be the directors and the storyboarders and the people at the top of the game like i think it's probably in the writer role is where you most often see women in other studios at least at that level um but you know we talked about this from the very first episode they are so much more equitable about that and so you get talents that you know might not be able to flourish elsewhere like a yamada naoko um and it is just incredible. Yeah, and that has been for me the the thing I've loved the most about this. And it's the thing that QAnny as a studio enables is being able to follow the people, right? Because I think with most other studios, this would be incredibly hard to do, right? If we tried to do a Studio Bones season and you tried to do most of what that <laughs> studio output and you're trying to follow, okay, who are the episode directors? Who is this, that, and the other thing? Um, it would be such a mess and a tangled web of so many different people involved because then you're also looking at, well, here's the like 15 different other production studios that worked on the show that, you know, sub they subcontract kind of subcontracted this episode out to and all of that. And that's, you know, interesting in its own right. But there's something with like KyoAni, you know, their production style is so clean and so easy to see the artist's hand on the screen and feel that. Um, that, you know, it wasn't even a, a specific intention of mine when we started planning the Kyoto Animation Studio to do the thing of tracking, okay, who's the episode director and all of that. That was just kind of like, it came out a little bit naturally out of my research and seeing, oh, hey, here's like where this person whose name I've heard, they were an animator on this episode. And so I tracked a couple of those things in the first few episodes, but it just became very apparent very quickly. Oh, like every... Every person who directs episodes on these shows is incredible, and all of them end up having these really th fruitful, insane careers, whether they stay at Kiwani or they leave and go work at Nintendo or go, you know, make the Idol Master anime or whatever, um, or obviously Yamada Naoko going off and working at Science Saru. Um, you know, it's such a studio that has created so many incredible artists and built up their careers, but also exhibits their talents so clearly for everybody to see that it feels possible and like necessary in some ways for like the maximum enjoyment to really track those names and see how they develop. And that was my favorite thing about doing this whole podcast was just following it from that angle, which we've never really discussed a show in that level of depth from the angle, of like who are the people who made the episodes and that kind of stuff. Oh, absolutely. And it's, you know, I think other than again, something like this is, this is more common in movies where you will have like a yeah. Hayao Miyazaki or someone, or obviously in live action cinema, lots of auteurs, and you get a sense of that. In episodic television, 
in part because it just it it does foreground collaboration, and that's something that's great about television. It is harder to have those individual relationships. And one of the cool things about KyoAni is that it is very much about collaboration. None of these shows are the works of individual. I mean, no works of cinema ever are generally the works of individual people. But you know what I mean. Like none of yeah. these are pure necessarily auteurist visions. You know, even the ones that are most, which I would say is like some of Yamada Naoko's movies. Well, that's also her and Reiko Yoshida, and it's her and the the composer that she starts working, who's like I forget his name, but he's like so clearly crucial to her style in those last couple movies. Um, and so you get to know both the individuals guiding things and the studio culture around them. And that makes something like, you know, my favorite thing we did this season was The Endless Eight Diaries. It's yeah. maybe my favorite podcast we've ever made. And I think part of it is because it wasn't just this amazing artistic experiment they did that was fun to watch and talk about. But it felt like having kind of a an individual relationship with each of the eight directors who did that. And like, yeah. oh man, I'm totally recognizing what Kitano Hara Noriyuki is doing here because this is so clear to him. And this is, oh my God, that amazing director who always had the crazy clouds. She put the crazy clouds back in. And it's stuff like that where it's just really hard to think of too many other places where you get those kind of deep relationships in an episodic TV format. And it's so, so cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's the thing where it's like, you know, they should do another Endless Eight, you know? Yes. I mean, they they shouldn't from a financial perspective, but from a creative <laughs> perspective. Like, if you have a, um, yes. and it's not just them, but, like, any studio, live action or animation that has the, this many, like, talented visual storytellers, like, Endless Eight, like, that's the thing that it was all about, was it allowed you to get such direct access to the director's brain and the storyboard artist's brain, which was the same on all those episodes on like, how are we going to visually tell the exact same story? Um, and it's like yeah. a science experiment. The story became the control. The story is the yeah. same every time. The script is the same every time. So all that's going to be different is what the storyboarder and director is going to do with it. And you're right. It's such direct access in a way that like you realize most visual mass media never gives you access to. Yeah, and, and most, I think, places would not be able to do that and really pull it off because you wouldn't have eight different people who could direct episodes that are so interesting and have such a different kind of flavor to them. Because, yes, I'm with you. Like, The Endless Eight is, that's my favorite podcast we did. And in many ways, I think that was one of the ones that helped open my brain to the bigger perspective of what kind of QA's culture and their artists were capable of. Because, you know, for me, this season was partially a season of rediscovery because so many of these shows were shows I had seen, but like 10 years ago. I mean, it was such a long time ago at this point. Um, you know, I was still like early in my undergrad when I watched things like Clannad and Hadahi for the first time and hadn't revisited those shows in forever. And so getting to kind of revisit all of those in this very different perspective and Endless 8 in particular being a thing I kind of bailed out on and didn't really get the first time to being like, one of my favorite things we have ever watched for any podcast ever, and certainly as a podcasting experience, the most fun to record. Um, like that for me is a huge kind of theme personally for the season and my experience of it was getting to revisit all these shows that I loved, but getting to see them through a very different lens, both because I've grown, but also being able to discuss it on a podcast just gives you different perspective. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, it was all discovery for me. I had not seen any of these shows. It was a wondrous period of discovery. There are a couple I didn't like as much as others. But man, I am there. I'll say this. There's none. I'm not glad we watched. Yeah. That's a unique. That's a that's a cool thing to be able to say. Right. And, you know, I do I ever really want to watch Beyond the Boundary again? No. Am I glad you and I for the rest of our friendship, we'll be able to make weird glasses fetish in-jokes <laughs> because of Beyond the Boundary. Kind of, yeah. We, suff we suffered through that one together, Sean, and that's a good time. Yeah, but you got to watch the fucking crazy idol episode in yes. the middle of that show, you know? Um, yeah. And, yeah, like, because yeah, Beyond the Boundary, obviously, is kind of like the, the, you know, the black sheep of what we've watched um, in general, like the black sheep in QA's output. Um but even then, it's like, it still looks better than almost any other TV anime. Yes. Like, it still visually looks so good. It's got some stuff in there that's absolutely fucking bonkers. Um, and yes, I'm with you that it's a, that I'm, even, I'm happy I revisited it. You know, even though I remembered not liking it that much. Um, it was fun to revisit that. It was fun to revisit some of the more obscure shows like Mirrored Colors, Phantom World. Like, I'm really glad that we added that chunk yes, in. Yes, I am. Um, 
because I understood it made sense to me at the time to cut it out. Um, but then once we ended up going so deep uh, into the weeds with this stuff, it's like, well, we have to. It's such a huge chunk of their studio's output to skip over this weird period of time where they kind of jump to these different genres and all these different kinds of adaptations from that contest they put on. Um, and it did end up making our <laughs> codification extremely long, um, even though it was already long. But it, those were some of the most fun ones to cover, even if they weren't really the best shows. Some of them, I mean, you know, I think Love, Chinibio, uh and Other Delusion Season 1 is phenomenal. I think that's a great season of TV. It inspired a big section of my dissertation. Uh, Myriad Colors Phantom World, great little show. I'm very glad we watched that. It's so much fun. You, sh you know, not every show has to be Clannot. Some yeah. shows should be able to be a Myriad Colors Phantom World, and that's good. That's healthy for, for everybody, for the industry, for KyoAni, just to yeah, cut loose a little bit on a show like that while still showing off their their narrative and their comedic chops. Um, and, you know, even if there's other things in there that weren't as interesting, I think for the project of the podcast where, you know, anything can be somewhat interesting if you put it under the kind of lens we do with it, I think, it was very crucial, I think, to appreciating what came later. You know, I don't think Violet Evergarden... There's a layer to Violet Evergarden that you can appreciate more when you've seen what Taichi Ishidate directed first. You know yes. what I mean? There's, there's something to see like, oh my gosh, this artist grew... Um, and they were already extraordinarily talented at the outset, but Violet Evergarden isn't something you make without growth. And I think it was important for us to see the points along the way. Absolutely. I mean, it's like going from Air to Kanon to Clannad, yes. you know, um, yeah. with Ishara Tatsuya. It's like nobody's first go at bat is going to be fucking Violet Evergarden or Clannad. You know, um, or, you know, with Takuma de Yasuhiro, we didn't cover these, but like Full Metal Panic Fumofu is a very uneven show. Um, if you go back and watch it, which I did on my own time, um, I rewatched <laughs> it. Um, and then and then he goes and makes Full Metal Panic the second raid. Again, we didn't cover that one because of all the Full Metal Panic stuff, but it's such a huge jump in quality because you see, okay, this is someone who has now had this experience. Um, you know, I mean, it's true of anything that's hard and complicated. If as a teacher, your first year, teaching you're not going to be good at it like that's just yeah. it's just not possible like you might end up being able to build good relationships and and you know be able to teach the kids stuff but you're going to make so many little mistakes um you're never going to have like a smooth first go at it um and yeah like like if for nothing else beyond the boundary was necessary for violet evergarden to be the thing that it was the exception to this entire rule is Yamada Naoko, who was uh, yes. perfect at it her first at bat. But she is also a genius, as we have yep. established. So, you know, she doesn't quite play by the rules of other human beings. Yes, that that is why I use the word genius for Yamada Naoko. Because it's like, <laughs> yes. for anybody else, it's like you can't, you know, you can be a, a, one of the world's best directors and not be a genius. Um, it's just you're not going to be able to do it perfectly the first time. You know, but yes. you only, you get, every once in a while you get an Orson Welles. Every once in a while you get a Yamada Naoko. Just like, shit, okay, yeah, yeah, you're one of those people. Yeah, it is. I do think, you know, there's always been the question of what is the citizen cane of X, Y, Z? What is the citizen cane of video uh -huh. games? What is the citizen cane of anime? The citizen cane of anime is Kaon, right? Like, it's yeah. just, it's so, what is the other example of a 24, 25-year-old making a show that is not just a masterpiece on its own terms, but, like, changes the shape of the industry? Um, and that that's Kaon. Again, like, I I think uh, uh, Hayao Miyazaki is an easy person to compare Yamada Naoko to, but he had, like, 15, 20 years of other things he did before he actually actually directed a movie um including the like i guess his first directorial thing is lupon part one but that's a whole weird thing right so it's like she's kind of singular yes yeah you know she you know did uh, one episode at the end of clanad and then within two years after that she directed Cam. or no within, yeah. yeah within two years after that Cam. Fucking nuts. Uh, we love her. Her new movie will be opening later this year. I'm very excited. They just announced it's getting IMAX screenings in uh, in Japan. Please give it some IMAX screenings over here, G-Kids, if, if you're listening. Yes, please. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so where do we wanna, what do we want to cover? We've got a couple of topics, Jonathan. What do you want to do first? Well, you wanted to talk about some uh, shorts, and I forgot to watch them. So this is the reverse of the thing from our Loop on the Third season, where I'd prepared a whole segment on Loop on the Eighth, and then you forgot to watch Loop on the Eighth, so I had to talk about it. So now um, we're even, because I forgot yes. to watch 
the Baja No Studio shorts. It's, it's Baja No Studio, please. Okay. I assumed it was like Baja Blast, the Mountain Dew <laughs> no, flavor. No, it is not like Baja Blast. So so this is, the, you know, I'm not going to go super long on this. Um, this is just like an advertisement for people to go uh, watch these because they're very delightful. Um, there were two shorts that Kigami Yoshiji directed, one in 2017, one in 2019. Um, the second one did release posthumously, though it was finished before uh, the arson attack happened. Um, these are called Baja No Studio or Baja Studio. Um, you know, that's basically the same thing. I don't know why I put the no in the notes here. It's probably just apostrophe S is easier. Um, but Baja Studio, which is, um, they're two different shorts. They're each about 20 minutes in length. And it is about a little like hamster or gerbil, you know, they're not specific, some sort of rodent creature that is a pet at a, uh, anime studio. That's an obvious sort of like pseudo stand-in for QAnnie. It's not meant to be like one-to-one -one for QAnnie, but it's obviously meant to sort of reflect certain things about QAnnie. Um, and it's about um, Baja just sort of like um, having fun at the studio. There is a woman who's the director of this magical girl show that the studio is putting on, and the director is under a tremendous amount of stress because there's a thousand different things coming by her desk, and she can barely kind of handle the pressure of this job, and she needs to go pet her beloved little hamster in the corner <laughs> to uh, get by during the day. And then at night, uh, Baja has um, adventures with the uh, magical girl character from the anime. The little figurine of that girl character comes to life. And then her, her villain, uh, Guy, who's this little boy wizard, he also comes to life. And they have like little uh, comic, whimsical, cartoon adventures. Uh, with uh, Guy, the, the villain is also voiced by the woman who plays Miss Kobayashi, which was a fun little uh, oh, that's cool. thing. Because it was around the same time that they were making that show. But yeah, it's it's just incredibly delightful. Um, and then the 2019 short is a sequel to that one where it's uh, the same sort of premise and the same setup, but it's about Baja and his friend Ga, who is a little rubber ducky that comes to life. Um, they go to the ocean, basically, is what the second one is. And they are just really delightful animated shorts um, that are purely about the fun and inventiveness of animation. They're very much in the tradition of like a... Um, you know, Looney Tunes, not not as sort of like um, comedically sort of sharp as Looney Tunes, but it's a little bit more maybe like Disney-esque in terms of overall tone. And it's really a, meant to, I think, just be a way for you to enjoy the incredible animation, which is so gorgeous. Um, and it's such a sort of um, standout feature for Kigami Yoshiji, who's a guy who does not a uh, director director, right? Um, it's very interesting to compare them to the Munto OVAs, um, because the Munto OVAs, for people who don't remember, that's the first thing that QAnnie did as an independent sort of like studio production, these two OVAs that Kigami Yoshiji directed about Munto, a fairy king who has battles up in like the sky in another dimension. And then there's a girl, Yume Mi, on the ground, who's like an earth girl, and they sort of psychically connect with each other. Uh, those OVAs are very gorgeous. They're incredibly well animated and they're very well directed in that sense. But the story is super thin and too thin for the kind of genre they are because it just feels like that's not Kigami Yoshiji's thing is he's not like the guy who makes the story. Right? He's a guy who can tell the story if you give him the box to tell the story in. But you just never got the sense that he was the guy who wanted to make the box. Right? He just wants to be given the rules and find a way to tell the story within those rules. Um, but Bajano Studio because of the nature of the genre of these fun little comic kid shorts, the fact that the plot is super thin is not a negative anymore uh, compared to Munto. And so it just is a like really fun kind of freeing experience. If you're someone who just enjoys the art of animation for the sake of animation, uh, they are so cool. In particular, the second one is very fun because it's got a bunch of really gorgeous water animation, which you know is like Higami Yoshiji was an absolute master at. Um, so if people have a little bit of extra time and you need just to be kind of like soothed, if you're, you know, very stressed out or busy or something, take 20 minutes, watch one of the Bajano Studio shorts and just have a good time enjoying beautiful, whimsical animation because that's what they're all about. Okay, uh, I am. Um, this sounds like something I would love. This sounds like my kind of thing. So I should have watched this. Uh, I, I I was looking for them again, and I remember why I maybe forgot to watch them. Is they're slightly hard to find. They're not yes. as easy as some of the other ones. I'll say from looking at them right now, I just found torrents for them because um, they don't have I don't think official distribution here. Not not um, in English, no. Yeah. Um, use the Japanese titles Baja no Studio, and then the second one is called Baja no Mita Umi. 
Uh, and if you use those, the torrents are easier to find and there are them out there. There's not as many as like for, you know, Clanad or something where you've got your pick of torrents with different things on them, but uh, you can find them. Um, there's a Blu-ray of the first one in Japan. I actually can't find if there was for the second one, but they uh, for are, the they second are one, there is I'm, I'm thinking of, I might just actually fucking buy this thing um, in November 2019. They have. Um, a big Blu-ray collection that has a bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff for product productions they had from 2017 to 2019, and the second one is included on that. Um, that oh, cool. Blu-ray is called, in Japanese, Watashi Tatsuwa Ima Zenshu Nisen Jukunen, um, which is like, right now, all of us, all together, 2019. That's a very hard title to try to translate yes. to English because it's uh, very sort of sparse. But yes, it's got a bunch of, like, production details and interviews and stuff like that on various shows and one of the things on that is uh the second Bajana studio short awesome well there you go that's how you can find those and it sounds wonderful they are they are very wonderful and and you've missed out jonathan on not watching them well i'm sorry i you know keep an eye keep an eye on my letterbox maybe i'll i'll rate and review those there um, because they, they include letterbox is completely random with what they do and don't include as a movie, but they do generally include OVAs as movies. They're not movies, but that's fine. Um, it's a movie is whatever you want a movie to be. Yes. Yes. Th these are definitely not movies. <laughs> <laughs> Though the animation's so good. You could put it in a movie theater. Nobody would really blink oh, an eye at it. Is there any Q any show that's not true for? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's just sort of, you could do it for any of them. And they did it for a lot of them when they made their movies yes, they and did. just said, hey, let's just, you, you want to marathon all the episodes of Tomoko Market? Uh, here you go. Let's just have a yeah. good time with it. Well, Sean, the big thing we were going to do today was we talked about, do we want to rank the shows? And that felt like it was going to break our hearts if we had to say, and it might cause arguments and what, you know, yeah. if we wanted to say what is number two, what is number one. Um, but we thought, well, we can make a tier list. Tier lists are fun. So we're going to do that. Uh, I have a tier list set up here, and I've put all the shows in here, and I've broken most of them out by seasons. We might not need to use the different seasons cores for some of them, but some of them we will need to use. So I generally broke those out. And I have seven tiers here. Let me go through them, and then you can decide. We can decide if we need to cut down on these tiers or add them. But I have God tier, which I've called Haruhi, because it's her world. We're living in yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Double S tier, which I've called After School Tea Time. S tier, which I've called the Torpedo High Jump, which uh, our friends of Nichi Joe invented. A tier is Lucky Channel. B tier is Wicked Lord Shingon. C tier is Audition Drama. And D tier is Glasses Fetish. I, I think let's keep those all for now. We'll see. We might end okay. up having a tier that's is underpopulated. We might squish it later, but I think that's that's good to start with. All right. Well, here's all our shows. Again, big, big ass block of shows here. Um, let's do the easiest one first. Can I put Beyond the Boundary and its movie in uh, Glasses Fetish tier? Yes, this is the easiest one to do. Um, okay. It, it goes at the bottom. It's, <laughs> yeah, there's kind of no question right. about it. Okay. Where do you want to go next? What else do you have strong feelings on right off the bat? Um, I think probably what's, what's something we want to put in the God tier? Haruhi. Um, yes. That's an easy one. Although and we have multiple things do does season one season two and the movie do those all go in the same tier i have here the show and the movie separate i would say they're all of a piece and go together in the god tier yeah. in fact i think if you were breaking them out i i do think it's even stronger as a collection of whatever order you watch them in the 28 episodes in the movie than I think maybe any of those pieces are in isolation. I do think it is the overall thrust of, of Suzumi Haruhi that makes it as much of a masterpiece as it is. Yeah, I think I agree. It's it's like it's complicated to try to think to rate it because how would you how would you even separate season two? Like because then because then what are you ranking? Yes. Like are you ranking the season two episodes on their own and the season one the season one in broadcast order? Yeah. So let's just say it's it's all included when we say Haruhi. It's all of those variants. It's broadcast order. It's uh, you know uh, chronological order with the season two without the season two. Whatever it all goes in there. And I'm thinking Clanad, which I've also just put as Clanad and not broken out after story. Yeah. If, if that's not a god tier, I'm not sure what is. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I think the other one that I'm, I know we're in pretty much lockstep on the masterpiece status of is Kaon. I have put Kaon as Kaon, Kaon, and movie Kaon. But I, that's another one that kind of like Haruhi, I think is just Kaon. 
and I think it is all of a piece, and I think it probably goes in the top top tier. I think you probably think that. I'm not sure. Yes. I'm, I'm, if we like wanted to be very exact, like I think Kon season two is probably my favorite of the three Kons. Um, but I don't know if there's a, like a notable difference enough to actually put that in like a different tier. Um, yeah, because I don't because I don't think it would be low enough. Like the other ones are weaker in any notable way to put them in a lower tier. Um, so yeah. yeah, are you? But but I think we're in agreement. Kon is one of the like canonical god tier shows. Yes. Okay, so for now I'm just gonna take. Kaon, because there we go, uh, and I'm going to put it in God tier, and now the arguments can begin. Okay, um, let's see. Let's go. Let's 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 just let's talk about the first show we did. You know, because I think this is going to be an interesting one yeah. to rate. Air. Where does Air go? I think it's an A or an S. I think it's Torpedo High Jump or Lucky Channel. Really? I think. Yeah, I think maybe maybe A, maybe Lucky Channel. I wouldn't put it low. I, I think Air is like pretty extraordinary as a first work. Um, I think on its own terms, it's pretty extraordinary. It took me aback. Um, you know, it's got the episode. I think it's the Kikami Yoshichi episode near the end that, uh-huh. that you called one of the best episodes of anime ever produced. Um, yeah, I, I think I think probably it does not break into the S's, but I also don't know if I would put it as low as B. I, I think A is probably where I put Air. Yeah, because I'm I'm wavering between A and B because Air is Air is weird because it's got such really high highs, particularly that Kigami Yoshi episode, the penultimate episode, but it is also by far the most inconsistent of the QAMI shows. Like it is, it it waffles in quality in a lot of different ways. So I think let's put it at A for now, and we might okay. end up. I don't think it'd go higher. There's a chance that it might have to get knocked down. And I, you know, here's the thing where our perspectives are different. Air is the first QAnon show I watched, obviously, because yes. it's the first show we did this season. Um, so I did, I definitely did not feel that waffling quality that you talked about. And I don't think you're wrong. I think if I watched it again now, I would probably have a different feeling of it because I would know what I'm comparing it to in terms of later QAnon, right? Mm-hmm. But for me, it was the, it, honestly, it was kind of a shock just how, like, brutally like sad and expressively animated and all that stuff because it was the first one I saw so that maybe makes me lean a little harder on it in terms of putting it higher than you would and I think that's just a difference from where we came at it yeah because I think for me part of what where I'm coming from it is the like I don't know if the show fully balances its various elements of like the other like quote unquote heroines, right? And you have like those mini arcs around those two yeah. other side characters that are Misuzu. And that is like where it feels notably weaker, particularly when you then have like Clanad that is so much better at, at balancing those characters. But obviously Air is like doing something slightly different. So I think A is a good spot to put it. Um, well, I think it does it better than Kanon. I think that's yes. the interesting thing is that I think Air made the right cuts to where it feels very coherent as a 12 episode show and Kanon is 24 episodes which is like the right length in terms of episode count for adapting that visual novel but I think we would both agree the shape of it as a show is is in some ways wrong and I don't know what the right answer is but I think Kanon to me it's not a D but it's it's probably a B or a C yeah I'm I'm wavering between B or C as well for Kanon um Conan has some great parts. Let's not, yeah. you know, forget that. And uh it's it's got some of the best dance animation you'll ever see in in a couple of the, the that big ballroom scene and some other things. But I, I think probably B or C, maybe C. Where what do you think? Let's put it at B for now. I'm okay. starting to worry that we're not gonna end up anything in, in C tier. So we might okay. have to move some of these things around, but let's. That's that yeah. feels right relative to where air is. Is where my okay. head is at with that one. Just taking these in the order they're they're coming in my list here, which was basically the order we did them. Lucky Star for me is an easy S or double S. Yeah, it's not quite god tier, but it's S or double S. I think pretty easily. Yes, um, it's definitely either S or double S. Let's put it at S for now. I think is where okay. Where I'm leaning with it. I'll say my instinct would be double S. We can revisit it later. Uh, you know, 
I, I had, to, I'll just say also Lucky Star has a cameo appearance in my dissertation during the Haruhi chapter because it's the thing between Haruhi seasons. And so I had to, that was the hardest three paragraphs of the entire fucking dissertation to write was explaining Lucky Star to other people who don't oh, know yeah. what Lucky Star is. And the joy I got, Sean, the, the, the like difficulty, but also the joy of explaining the Gutuza, Gotoza joke. Yes. Like... It's stuff like that. It's it's the whole existence of Lucky Channel. It's the it's something I love in in Kyoani's more experimental per- period, which is maybe my favorite Kyoani thing. Where it would be probably double S for me for that. Um, but that's that's part of it. Is I just there's something that explaining it made me love it even more. Oh, I mean, Lucky Star is amazing. Um, it's like and again, it's not locked in. Like we need to right. like get some things in here and then yes. see how it feels. Um, I agree. Yeah. All right, we're skipping disappearance, Kaon, Kaon. Uh, so we have Nichijou and Hyoka. Um, and here's where we have, these are like very mild differences. Both of these, we agree, are A-plus amazing shows. Um, yes. Hyoka would be in my personal god tier. I don't know if it would be for you. And that's fine. I would be fine putting it in double S. But I think Hyoka is, if for no other reason than it is one of the most beautifully animated shows ever, it is, I think, the... The, the the most significant work of Takamoto Yasuhiro's lifetime. It's so good. Yeah. Um I mean it's either God or, or double S. Um and actually okay. I I think that for both Hyoka and Ichijo for me yeah. are in that in that good. space. Okay. But I'm I'm worried that we're just gonna have like a dozen shows in the God tier. <laughs> then what's the point of having all these other tiers, right? I'm good putting those both in double S right now. And I think yeah. that gives double S a little bit of shape to help us start explaining what it is which is absolute fucking masterpieces um but maybe not uh, like god mass i don't know this is where we're, we're really splitting hairs here in a way that yes. we would not have to for most other studios because i think for one of the things when i, I look at the god tier and this doesn't necessarily be that we have to take this into account but there's something about those shows that they are not just like all-time great shows but they like also fundamentally changed the landscape of tv anime as you know it <laughs> they came yes. out right um and again that that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be that for those shows like their public reception doesn't have to be that sort of cataclysmic for the whole industry um but at the same time there is something about the gravity of those three that we have in god tier that is so powerful that feel like hyoka and Nichijou just never quite quite get over whatever that that thin line is I would agree with that, and I think that makes that feels right. Like, you know, I love Hyoka and Nichijo. Like Haruhi has a starring role in my dissertation for a reason because it's it's about a moment of anime evolution, right? And that's yeah. a slightly different thing. And and you can decide whether or not that's something you know you individually value. But I do think if we're calling something god tier, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Uh, then we get into, I might want to put the whole Love, Chinibio and Other Delusions discussion aside for a second. <laughs> that's yeah, that's going to be, be complicated because I feel like those are going to end up being in different tiers. Um, yes. Those, All three those... of them will be in different tiers. Um, okay. Uh, let's do Tamako Market really quick because this one's interesting because the show, I'm kind of happy to put wherever you want it. I think Tamako Love Story just needs to be in whatever tier is above Tamako Market goes because I think it is that kind of like leap for Yamada Naoko as a director. I mean, I, 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 for me, Tamako Market is either an S or a double S. I want to say a double S. I'm going to say a double S. Well, then I'm going to put it in S and I'm going to, because I had a little less. So if we're evening out our, our, our okay. feelings on it, then I think that feels right. And having Tamako love story, um, which I realize if you can't read Katakana, some of this you might not be able to read if you're watching this, but that's okay. Um, you can see the pictures. Um, Tamako Market here in S and Tamako Love Story in double S. Will you I'm, be able I'm, to live with I, that? I, I can live okay. with this. Okay. I can live with this. I know that you're a heathen that doesn't have the incredible, unabiding love for Tamako Market. I mean, if I'm being truly truthful to myself, maybe Tamako Market is the god tier. Um, but I know that you're never going to accept that. Okay. Well, we'll we'll have other disagreements too. Um, here's another easy one. I'm just going to grab right now. Koi no Katachi, Silent Voice. That's a god tier, right? That's easy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's just that's easy. Okay. Um, Myriad Colors, Phantom World. That's a an A or a B, I think. Yeah. I. Would... Oh man, is it A or B? Oh geez, that's hard. That's that's a. Uh... Hmm. It's a better show than Kanon. If we put it in B, I think Kanon yeah. goes down to C. I think if we put it in A next to Air, that doesn't feel wrong to me. They're very different shows, but I think yeah. they're... Yeah. 
Um, let's put it in A for now. I think that okay. that seems that seems good. Put it next to air. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, some of these last ones we have are big franchises to break out. Yeah. Violet, Violet Evergarden. This is one that's interesting to try to break out because I have it as the show in the two movies. I think I can disaggregate Violet, Violet Evergarden into its pieces. Like, I think in my heart of hearts, I think the movie is a god tier and the other two are like one notch below that. But I don't know how you feel. Yeah, I mean, you know, like the fina- the last two episodes of Violet Evergarden are notably not as good as the rest of it. But I I don't know if it's enough for me to feel like it would go in a different tier. Um, I think it would be fine next to next to Hyoka and Nichijo. I think it would feel appropriate there. Um but I do think like the, the the one called Violet Evergarden the movie is to me in the god tier, and I think I probably put the other two in the tier or a tier below that. I think I can live with that. I think my instincts maybe would be to have it all just be in the god tier, but I think that I can see where you're coming from. Um, if you wanted to break it out, I guess I'm just trying to express, and this just to me is like a, a way of praising the show, is that I just think like that movie. I, I feel like I need to express some way in which it is some kind of artistic leap and i think it really is i think over the show and over uh even gaiden which i i, I think gaiden is a leap over the show i think there, there's there's a certain way that that violet evergarden snowballs um in a in an incredible way but yeah i think i think i don't know if i would put violet evergarden the show next to klanad haruhi or kaon but i would definitely put the movie next to koi no katachi if that makes sense sure i can see that i can see that well we've got that for now um, okay, we're left with the stickier stuff. The sound euphonium jungle, which is five yes. different things, and the Love Chinibio and Other Delusions trio. Do you want to just do Kobayashi San's Made Dragon first and didn't get that sure. out of the way? Because I think those are yeah. easier. Um, I think what it, wherever we put it, I do think uh, the first season, and I know you agree, would be in a higher tier than yes. the second season. The second season is not bad, but I think it's like an A, probably an A tier. And yes. then the other I would one is say maybe S. the first season is A, or the first season is S, and the second season okay. is A, which okay. is confusing because the second season is called S. But yes, you know, it's, it's, it's just it's <laughs> we'll not it quite there. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Now we've got these other ones. Yes. My case, I I think Love Chinibio and Other Delusions. I don't want to forget the enthusiasm we we both equally had for it in season one. And I think that first season would go in the S tier. If we've got Lucky Star and Tomoko Market and Kobayashi San uh, no Mei Dragon in there, that to me is win- in that tier. And I'm happy to put the other two lower wherever you want them, but that is where I would fight to put that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think it's between an S or an A. I think it's it's probably like at the bottom of the S's, if, you know, if you're ranking within the S's, but I think it's fine to put it in an S. It's my least favorite of the S's, I guess I'll say it that way. I like it more than Tamako Market or Kobayashi, but I, I'm just happy it's Madness. there. Madness. Okay. I mean, it's a really good show, but it's not better than It's a really good show. Uh, and then you've got the second season in the movie. Uh, I think the movie is better than the second season. Yes. And I think they're probably all in different tiers, but uh, I don't know. What's what's your instinct here? I mean, my instinct is to put the second season next to Kanon. I would have it be in the okay. Oh, I'm fine with that. I thought you were going to say C. I'm fine with it in B. That's fine. I think we're probably um, going to end up getting rid of C. I don't know if anything's going to be in C. I don't know. I could I could see putting Kanon down in C, but that's fine. Um, and then take on take on me, where we put that? Um, I guess B or A. Um, I don't have a strong preference on if it... Because I, I do feel like it's a little bit better than Season 2, but I don't think it's like notably better than season two um it's kind of hard to rank though because it's it's a movie versus the tv shows you know i will say this i think if i if we're putting them in the tier list this is where tier lists are helpful i definitely wouldn't put it above myriad colors phantom world air or miss kobayashi's dragon maid s so that is where this feels like the right place whatever we wind up calling these tiers in the end yeah okay now we are left with the sound euphonium log jam can we just put Liz and the Bluebird really high to start? It's Yeah, that's the <laughs> highest of them. I would put it... I don't know if I'd go God tier. Like, if we're looking... If we're comparing it to a silent voice, I feel like silent voice is better. Yes. Like, I and I think it's about as good as Tamako Love Story. Um, it's, like, a little bit hard to, like, say, like, is it better than Hyoka or Dichichi? That's, like, that's a fucking weird conversation. But if you're looking at the movies in those tiers, that makes sense to me. 
I agree. I think it is that, like Viola Evergarden, Gaiden, Tamako, Love Story, those feel of a piece to me artistically. Yes, they're amazing, but they're just like a little bit below Violet Evergarden, the movie, and, and Silent Voice. Yeah, I think that feels right. Okay. Um, Man, <laughs> this is where we just have... Okay, Sound Euphonium 1 we were pretty in agreement on, and I think that's a, an S or a double S. Yeah. But... Um... But I, but yeah, this is where it gets hard. Frankly, I would put the sound, the sound euphonium movie, Our Promise of Brand New Day, in D in Glasses Fetish. I don't like that movie, and Sound Euphonium Three would be a C for me because it's all audition drama. But you don't think that, so this is where we we get to log log jam. Yeah. So I think for me, I would put Sound Euphonium season one and two in the same tier. Like I don't think there's a notable difference in their qualities. You know. Okay. What tier would that be? Probably S. That yeah, next to Chinibio de Makoigashtai, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I put those in the same tier. And right now the tiers are not ordered in any specific way. What's in yeah. the tiers? We can do that later if we want. Um okay. And then the other things we can put lower than that? I I mean I wouldn't put I Sound Euphonium 3 is the best Sound Euphonium thing on TV. Putting Liz and the Bluebird aside, I think Sandy Could not disagree is the best. more. You're, you know, you're crazy. I'm fine with putting think... the movie one lower. Um, okay. Well, now I would put it TV. that low, but okay. I think it can it's, go. Yeah, put it next to the Love Chini the Other Delusions movie. There we go. Okay. I, uh, I, those two movies are like I would rate those identically. Okay, that's fine. Um, I guess I'm okay putting Sound Euphonium 3 in, in A tier if you want. It, I want to stress it would not be in my A tier or anywhere near it, but if that's what you want, I'm okay with that. But if we are trying to meld our minds on this tier list, we are not having it. When two-thirds of the people on that episode did not like it, I don't think it should be at the same tier for the podcast as a whole as 1 and 2. Can we can we put it in, in A tier and then in the description of A tier say that it's really, that Sound Euphonium 3 though is really an S or a double S? Uh, you can think whatever you want in your heart of hearts. Okay. I mean, you can be wrong about your opinions on this show. That's fine. Okay. Uh, did not like that season. Uh, oh God, it's just looking at it, it's looking at the way those tears work out. Now it's just, now it all feels wrong. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, Sean. Let's, let's revise then. Let's see what we want to do to massage this a little bit. Um... Do we want to do anything with the D, or D tier? Do we want to get rid, or the C tier, which currently is empty? Do we want to get rid of it, or do we want to create some space and move some things down? I think we probably want to move a couple of things down. And I think the first thing we should say is that this is all relative to Kyoto animation, not yes. to anime on a whole. Like in, if you were to rank all anime on a spectrum beyond the boundary, probably is not a D. If F is the lowest and A is the, and like, S oh, is the no, highest. yeah. If, yeah. On so. a general scale, <laughs> it's not even close to being a D. I mean, I don't okay. like that show that much, but like, I don't, I mean, I've, I got pretty annoyed at the movie for some of its choices, but I don't despise Beyond the Boundary in the way that I've seen some anime that's truly terrible. Yeah, so I just want to say that. And then I think I I would move some of this A and B, A, some A stuff down to B and some B stuff down to C is kind of where I would think. Like, I think Kanon and Shinibio Season 2 might be Cs if we're... I'm fine with that. Okay. I'm fine I would that. put the Sound Euphonium movie there too, but you said no, so that's fine. No. Um, you should watch that movie again, that's good. Okay. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I have better things to do with my 90 minutes. All right. Um, <laughs> pissing Sean off. I'm sorry. I mean, you're um, wrong about it. It's, it's fine. I probably put Kobayashi-san S with the Bs at this point. Uh, and maybe Myriad Colors Phantom World 2. I don't know. But but do, would any of these A's go down It feels like you're just feet? evacuating the A. Um, That's true. I mean, I, I can see S going one lower. Uh I don't know. Let's let's leave it alone for now. I don't know. I don't. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's, let's see go to the top chance. and look up here. Everything that's in God tier right now, I think, needs to stay in God tier. Is there anything we want? Like, do Hyoka and Nichijo just jump up to God tier, or do they stay in double S? Is double S good as it is? Um. I mean, I think God tier is good. I don't think we need to touch God tier. I, I will say from all of these, I want to. I want to move Lucky Star to double S. If I could argue for one more thing on this tier list, that would be my thing. I don't know if you feel the same way, but that would just be... Can we move Tomoko Market with it? Sure. Or wait, no. Can we move Sound Euphonium 3 with it? 
No, nope. you're not going to take that. We can we can do. You like Lucky Star? This is a this is a I much might, smaller yeah. leap. <laughs> I also really like Saudi Phonium Three, and so I wanted to get higher on 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 our ranking. But I but that's my point. If we both like Lucky Star, we and I didn't dislike Tomico Market. I just wasn't as crazy about it as you are. Yeah. Now Double S does feel very full, but it also feels somewhat appropriate. Uh, yeah. What what else needs to be balanced here? I don't know. Do you have? Is there anything else that you feel like should be moved? I'm looking at it, and I, you know, here's the thing: the tornado, uh, torpedo, high jump tier that I have here, the S tier, feels fairly appropriate to me. Of those four, I would put those four shows on a spectrum for me myself in terms of quality. So I actually think those four make sense. That's kind of yeah. why I, th- I just Lucky Star is like of a piece different, in part because it's easy to forget because it comes in the middle of the Haruhis, but Lucky Star also had a massive impact on the industry. Oh, yes. And it's kind of poking at that, you know. Like, to me, Tomoko Market would belong with these other four. That's where it feels like to me. If you feel like it's higher, I'm happy to do that. But, like, if I'm looking at, like, shows that feel like of a piece to me, the the S's feel right right now. The double S's mostly feel right. We have the the difficulty with movies being different is always a thorn. Yeah. But yeah. Because I do because it's like I guess I would just say that Tomiko Love Story is like the best thing in Tomiko in the Tomiko Market universe or whatever. But I don't feel like it is a notable. It's like that different, um, in terms of like creative quality. If you think about some of like, you know, like the episode of Tomiko Market with the dad, where it ends with the dad like playing the song on the guitar that he ripped to the mom, right? Like the DNA of all that stuff is so infused into the show that I think it, it honestly makes sense to me to have it, Tomiko Market and Tomiko Love Story be in the same same category. And I think you're, and, and Lucky Star does feel better being an SS to me. Um, I feel also like Tomiko Market to me is a notably better show than Sound Euphonium, Kobayashi's Made Dragon, or Love Chinibu and Other Delusions. So yeah, and I can see all that. I think my only argument with Tomiko Love Story, and this is not an argument of me putting down market. It's an argument of me uplifting Love Story. Because I think Tomiko Love Story just, it does feel like a leap moment for Yamada Naoko as a director. I think like the storyboarding on that movie, the like the relative seriousness with which it kind of calms down and is this two-hander very very small story about two people like the focus with which it approaches things that is what like took me aback and like i can understand the argument that they're not that different qualitatively they are very different tonally and like in terms of some of the like visual style and things like that like it is a, a pretty astonishing leap and i think it's part of why love story had that you know reaction from like film critics of like oh my god this is this is cinema and it won awards and stuff like that i see where that reaction comes from so that's why they feel like slightly different tiers to me but i don't i i don't i i understand your argument too of them being together yeah i think it's just like tomico market has a because it has like that broader focus it, it is a little bit bigger and more comedic in those places but all of the stuff of what you identify in Love Story is still in there in Tomica Market. Tomica Market just gets pared down to Love Story in the movie. So that's why, to me, in my experience of those, it feels like a very natural continuation. Okay. Um, so I think we like S, double S, and God. Yes. It seems like. So going back down here, uh, I would... Uh, let's see, I don't know. Is this Is this good? Are there any other changes you want to make? Would you be fine with just putting Sound Euphonium 3 next to the other two seasons? Would that be acceptable to you, putting it in S? And just just, I, just having it be a, a bunch? I strongly feel Air, Myriad, Colors, Phantom World, and Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid S are better seasons of TV than Sound Euphonium 3. Like, and I strongly feel bones. that Sound Euphonium 3 is a better show than all three of those. Pretty easily, honestly. Ugh, but. Oh my god. Um... We just this is this is just the the least we've ever seen eye to eye on something, so it's tough. I'm okay on the level of it is all just sound euphonium for TV, and we can put it on a spectrum. And I can admit that outside of that first season, I don't think it's a very good show, and I can just kind of ignore its presence there. Um, so I'm okay with that in that sense. If it makes yeah. you feel emotionally better, we can do the thing we did with Kaon and just have it be the picture for Sound Euphonium Season 1 with the understanding that all of it is there together. I'm good with that. Does that, 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 that it, calm you down? When you, when you just say it is the 50 episodes or so, or however many Sound Euphonium is, because it's one core and then two cores and then another core, right? So it's four cores, so it's 50 episodes. Uh, no, uh, no. Season 2 is... Cores. Oh, it Sister is, okay. Cores. I was... 
I was thinking of KO and has the second season is longer. For some reason, I think Sound Euphonium 2 is like double the length of the other two. Um, maybe because it's very slow and poorly paced. But anyway, no, it's, I'm just it's kidding. Just, Sound Euphonium <laughs> is just, it's a really okay. phenomenal TV series, you know, that I think it really tells a, a really powerful story about students growing up in school and it reflects on their experiences and how that evolves over the course of the school years. And I just think it really, it hits on something that I've never seen another TV show do. Um, and now that I'm back teaching school again, um, I have a new batch of students. Man, I'm thinking about Kumiko every day. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here fucking walking the walk. I'm living that life. Well, I, and I, I acknowledge all that. I'll also just point out again, it's a show with a hell of a lot of queer baiting for a show that is ultimately grossly heteronormative, but that's fine. Um, it's why I'm glad Kobayashi we have placed just a little higher because it is not grossly heteronormative. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Uh, this feels like a decent balance to me. It is definitely weighted towards the top, but that is uh, true of Kyoto Animation yes. as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I, think, I think this is good. This looks good to me. Okay. So do we want to, do we, do we care about the order in which they are placed in here? Does that matter at all? Or are they just together in the tier and the tier is the thing that is ranked? I, th- I think just the tier is where it's ranked. Because if you try to rank individual things in there, then it just gets really complicated, especially if you're trying to compare the movies <laughs> to the yeah. TV shows. It's like, yes. you know, is Tomical Love Story better than Joe? I don't fucking know. I don't know, how to, I don't know how to compare those two things directly to each other. I could say that they both feel like they are similar qualitative levels. All right. Well, then, uh, for, for people who are listening to this and not watching the YouTube thing, let's quickly go through for our, we'll go from bottom to top, for the glasses fetish tier, a.k.a. D tier, we have uh, Beyond the Boundary and its film sequel, I'll Be Here, which might be even worse. Yes, I, you know, they, they all get to just be, they get to be in D, and we yeah. don't have to think about it too much. All right, our C tier, which is called Audition Drama. I don't even really like the name of that tier because I feel like it kind of biases um, certain things because I don't feel like the audition drama is a problem in the series. But whatever, Jonathan can have his little, can have his child. It's little all jabs. of season three. It is Oops All Audition Drama. And, you know, the same way I don't buy the Captain Crunch that is Oops All Crunch Berries. I like a mix. Uh, I don't like Sandy Funny 3 as much because that's all it is. I mean, it's really, it's all about anxieties around growing up and graduation, but we don't have to talk about that right here. Uh, C tier Doesn't is, even know what a duet is. <laughs> C tier is Kano and Love Chinibio in Other Delusions Season 2, or Love Chinibio in Other Delusions Heartthrob. Wicked Lord Shingon tier, B tier, is Love Chinibio in Other Delusions, the movie Take On Me, and Sound Euphonium, the movie, Our Promise, A Brand New Day, or Chikai no Finale, if you don't want to be an idiot. Yes. Uh, the Lucky Channel tier, tier A, is uh, Air, uh, Myriad Colors Phantom World, and Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid S. Torpedo High Jump, the S tier, is Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, Love Chinibio and Other Delusions, the first season, and Sound Euphonium, the whole enchilada. There you go. Our after school tea time tier, double S, is this is a biggie Shoka, Nichijo, Tamako Market, and Tamako Love Story, uh, Liz and the Blue Bird. Violet Evergarden, the TV show. Violet Evergarden, Guide In, uh, Eternity in the Auto Memory Doll, and Lucky Star. Lucky Star, indeed. And finally, the Haruhi tier, God tier, because she is the one who wheeled all of this into being. The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya and its film sequel, The Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya, Clanad and Clanad Afterstory. Keon, all of it. Koe no Katachi, or A Silent Voice, and Violet Evergarden, the movie. There we go. That sounds good. That feels good. That anyway. sounds good. I feel like we have some closure on this. I feel good about this. So, Sean, I also think we should just go through some quick... That was us kind of coming to a meeting of the minds on some of these. But I think we should also just answer some questions. So I have a couple I'm going to do rapid fire at you, and, and I'll answer, give my answers too, hopefully. Uh, and then we can... Uh, if you have any, you can ask me too. So, But I'm going to put it to you right now. Favorite show? Kaon. Okay. Uh, minus Haruhi. I think yeah. for me, it's, 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 I, I still have not recovered from the melancholy of Kaon ending. Like, I feel like that's like, <laughs> that's just like the eternal emotional state of my life is, is like, oh man, Kaon was really good. Uh, like, I was very happy when we finished whatever show was after Kaon because I was able to put that Blu ray on top. So I have my stack of all the Blu rays we were watching uh, to the left of where my PlayStation is. 
Um, and I had yeah. them stacked in the order that we watched them in. So when I finished one, I put it on the finished stack. So I just had the complete collection of Kaon staring at me for a couple of weeks every time I walked by my TV. And I just, every time I was like, oh, oh, Kaon. And then, yeah, so it's it's for me, it's Kaon. Yeah, mine is the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. It is the show that has lived most rent free in my head since we watched it it's the sh it's the show i wound up writing a very big chunk of my dissertation on uh and i just you know i think if you asked me like critically it's here's the funny thing chapter one of my dissertation which is one of my favorite things i've ever written because it came together in such a weird way but half of it is the history behind the the first mobile suit gundam movie and the the sort of rally that happens around that and sort of that moment as one of the moments where anime is kind of born and defined and then the second half of that chapter is about haruhi and the things around Haruhi that are a redefinition and rebirth of anime. And I was sitting back and thinking on this as I was revising it recently, and I was thinking, if someone asked me, Jonathan, what are your what do you think is the best anime ever made? I just think it's those two. Like those are probably my answer. I think it's the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya from 2006 and and season two from 2009 definitely uh and mobile suit gundam from 1979 like those are probably my two like the, i think the best um just personally uh and so i love that show i think about it all the time it's the one that when we're done with this season i have most wanted to like go re-watch when oh, i have time to sure. rewatch some kyoani stuff um and I, so i've got these you know dvds i'm excited to do that with this set i've got um and, and I love it. So so that is probably my answer. I think Kaon is also a great answer, and I completely see where you're coming from. Obviously, there was no disagreement from us putting those both in God tier, so it makes sense. Yeah, I think with, with Haruhi, one of the things that's fun, and I like the comparison with Gundam, is that, like, you know, Haruhi is a show that has a lot of rough edges, you know, compared to some of yeah. the, like, compared to the other things in God tier, Haruhi is by far the most uneven, but that's kind of like a feature, not a bug of the yes. show. You know, like, there are a couple of episodes of Haruhi that aren't amazing, but the overall experience of the show itself so transcends those individual episodes in the same way that, you know, the Cuckoo's Donuts Island episode of Gundam is not great. I mean, it's not so bad it should be erased from history or whatever, like Tomino's <laughs> yes. trying to do with it. Um, and then ironically, a whole movie was made out of it later. Um, but, it, you know, Cuckoo's Donuts Island is notably worse than most of the other episodes of Mobile Suit Gundam. Um, but that doesn't really matter. Um, it's part of the overall texture of the show and it's fine for a show, an episodic TV show to have that level of like inconsistency. Um, and, and I think that that's one of the fun things about how to he is it sort of embraces that, um, and, and really leans into it. I am drawn to things where you can feel genius being worked out in real time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of both of those. Like, I think part of the thrill of Mobile Suit Gundam is that it doesn't just land perfect. It's a show that has, like, you can feel the the kind of, the, the brilliance and the masterpiece of it congealing as you watch it. And I think that's true of Haruhi also. I think it's true of some of the other shows we've watched. Um, and, and, you know, I'll say, like, Endless 8, just, I do think is, like, on the short list of best things ever done in animation in Japan, in America, anywhere. I think it's one of the most interesting, best uses of the animated format ever. And, like, it's a significant reason I would call it my favorite show. Absolutely. One of the things I'll, I'll point out with Kaon, that's also the thing I really love about it, um, is I love the the way in K that Kaon is able to totally reinvent itself for season two in a way that feels 100%. very subtle yeah. in real time. But as you get deeper into the season, you realize how much of a different beast it is. And it's a thing that a lot of other Kyoani shows we're not really able to replicate to their detriment. Um, like particularly Love Chini and Other Delusions is the most I feel that of where it's like, you know, Kaon told its full story in season one. And then when time came for season two, it's like, okay, well then what do you do? And it just reconsiders the whole structure of the show, how, where the characters are positioned relative to each other in terms of the way that the stories are told. Um, it's so incredible. And it's the thing that like, I've seen so many anime that have, fallen down at season two because they couldn't figure out how to do that and Kaon just makes it look like completely effortless i i could not agree more and i think it is one of the most exciting things watching it because we talked about this at the time you get done with Kaon and you're like well where the fuck do they go from here yeah. just even ignoring the story like how does it get better than that um in a way, like, I think that, you know, one of the shows that is one of our favorites of the current decade is Bochi the Rock. And mm -hmm. I love Bochi the Rock. I don't quite feel that same way. Like, I really want a season two because I feel like there's so much more to do with that. Kaon was like, 
well, if they never make more, that's so perfect. But then you're right. You watch 24 more episodes. You watch double what they made in season one, and then you're left wanting more. That's that's a magic trick. Yeah, it's crazy. So I think those are yeah. two good shows to be a, yeah. to be favorites. What about favorite movie? We watched a lot of movies. What do you think is your favorite movie that KyoAni has made? Oh, man. Um, favorite is, is hard. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's either Violet Evergarden... Like the the three that are in contention for my favorite would be Violet Evergarden, the Haruki movie, and uh, uh, Silent Voice, which um, are all in God tier, so it makes yes. sense, yeah. And it's it, and I would and agree I, with I that. love them all for very different reasons. Um, yeah. Um, i like my my heart tells me Disappearance of Suzumi Haruki. If you say favorite, like I don't know if I'd say that's the best one, but if you say favorite, like particularly it's the ending of that movie. Um, and partially this is also, I, I, you know, having read the book now and seeing like the magic trick of so literally adapting that book um, to like really minute details that they express on screen. And yet like the way that that brings everything to life. And then, of course, you have the whole finale with with Kion in his whole mind space and seeing the way that what is an incredible literary move of this sort of internal interrogation that Kion has of like this dialogue with himself on the page and seeing that visualized and expressed in the way that it is at the end of that movie. Like it's so incredible. Um, so I think that's still my favorite. This is the one I've seen the most. It's the one I keep coming back to every couple of years. So I would say that's my favorite. This is one where I think best and favorite feel slightly different to me. I think Silent Voice is the best movie they've made. I agree. And I think part of it is that Silent Voice is so standalone. It's, it's one movie there's no TV show attached. You could hand it to anybody and say, this is a two-hour movie. Watch it. Um, and it's one of the best KyoAni things you could do that with because it will introduce someone to the brilliance of KyoAni and the brilliance of Yamada Naoko and the brilliance of Reiko Yoshida and a lot of other people. Um, and it's it's and I think it's it's also could be an anime gateway drug. I think you could show that to people who have no experience with anime or animation, and I think they could fall in love with it. And I think all of that congeals that way. My answer for favorite would be Violet Evergarden, the movie, kind of the way you just said for Disappearance. Mm -hmm. It just, I mean, that movie hit me about as hard as anything we've watched for anything this season. Um, and it is just, it is so overwhelmingly beautiful. It is, it is so amazing the way it takes the raw pieces of what was already one of their best shows. And then I think elevates it a notch or two more by how it takes this sweep of history and of life itself and of death and of time and all these things and brings it together and it is both about the extreme minutia of two people trying to reconnect on this little island at one moment in time and it is also about the way a single life can echo throughout history uh and i think it is also as we said at the time especially because it is you know one of the works that comes out after the fire is is such an interesting synecdoche for what makes QAnny special and i think that's where my my mind comes on that yeah i mean it's yeah for me it's like a very close contest really between those three especially with the silent voice because i you know part of me it's like the manga is sort of wrapped up in that because i like the manga so much as well but yeah i mean with violet evergarden the movie it is also you know for me one of the most evocative last shots of a movie for me is the end of Violet Evergarden, the movie of the pan camera in the dark on the dirt road and Violet walking through with the lantern. Like that to me is so, such a powerful image and such a powerful way of ending that film in this weird dream space that sort of houses the movie. It's, it's so fucking good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. I have another couple of questions here. Favorite soundtrack to a KyoAni show? For, for me, this is pretty easy. It's Violet Evergarden. Okay. Yeah. Violet Evergarden would be very high. For me, I think it's... it's. <laughs> I already said this was my favorite show. I think it's Haruhi. I was listening to that soundtrack again yesterday, and it just... It, it also it's, it's we're doing favorite it just scratches my boxes very hard like it does some of this, these jazzy things it's got so much variety to it there's something about it that is so unbelievably evocative to me but I think I would probably have Violet Evergarden at like an easy number two on there for favorites um, it is also a perfect flawless amazing soundtrack um, I, I don't know, a lot of KyoAni shows had these I feel like the key anime uh, the key visual work shows are in a slightly different category because they're soundtracks written for the visual the novels game, that were put yeah. on there but they're obviously brilliant soundtracks anyway but you know we we sung the praises of Kaon's soundtrack i love the experimental soundtracks for koi no katachi and liz and the bluebird a lot of good stuff 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of, yeah, a lot of Q&A shows have amazing soundtracks. Like, like, for me, Evan Call's music on Violet Evergarden is so amazing. And then part of that is also seeing him now, you know, he does a really big show every couple of years, like, uh, for your yeah. Neon Journey's End. And so it's just cool to see him continue to grow and develop as a composer in this industry, because he's also just so young. Um, and, and I listened to the Violet Evergarden soundtrack on its own and have a lot since the show and I originally watched it. So it's like, I've just lived with that soundtrack for a long time. So it's an easy answer there, but there are multiple other ones. Like the Kaon soundtrack is also, I fucking adore, especially if you include the music of after school TT time, which is sort of part oh, yeah. parcel to it. Um, that soundtrack is phenomenal. And then also Octo Masada's work on sound euphonium, um, which gets complicated because it's like, what, what is and isn't the soundtrack is a little bit of a complicated conversation because he, you know, he did both, the like instrumental music played in the background of the show, the background music, but he also did so many of the compositions of the pieces that they play in the show, like Listen to Bluebird, like the story of a year in season three. Um, I think his work also is is really phenomenal. Um, and I think if I was like more into that kind of music, it like and I'd like had listened to those soundtracks and like the full movements and stuff, because you know, that dude made huge chunks of that music that never even were ended up being in the show because they just needed the full piece for like hey this song is playing in the tv in the background from this like interview or something um and so the those soundtracks are really good and particularly a lot of the light motif work in season three for sound euphonium is great so those are like the soundtracks that i particularly jumped out to me including also um Hadaki, which i love but violet Evergarden's my favorite all right well, that's a, that's a fun one. There's, these are all questions with no wrong answers is what's yes. fun. Um, favorite? Do you have a favorite episode of a KyoAni TV show? I mean, the, the, it, it feels cliche, but it's just like the, the thing that comes to mind immediately is Someday in the Rain. It's I mean, Someday it's, in the Rain. It's, Someday it's in the just rain is, like, yes. like, I want to come up with like a more creative answer to that. But I'm like, well, it's just fucking Someday in the Rain. I mean, the one that like, you know, the, whose title I remembered before we even like I knew the title of that episode before we even went back and rewatched the show. Um it was like I when I you know, I remember so vividly watching that one episode of Kanon season I think it's episode three of Kanon, being like, Is this the guy who did that Someday in the Rain episode? And I looked it up because like <laughs> the, there's just a scene in that episode that reminded me so much of the ending of Someday in the Rain. I'm like, it totally is. Holy shit. And that was my introduction to knowing who Kitano Hara Noriyuki is. Um and being like fucking goddamn. Um obviously there's too many incredible episodes to count. There's like the penultimate episode of Air is a huge standout. Any Kigami Yoshi episode is a huge standout. But if you wanted to boil it down to one, it's got to be Someday in the Rain. It's Sean, this question is here because Someday in the Rain exists. If yeah. Someday in the Rain weren't there, I would think, oh, that's too big a question to ask. We watched hundreds of episodes yeah. of anime. That's silly. We shouldn't be asking this. But because Someday in the Rain exists, I just... I, I just, I kind of like in my bones just think it's like the best episode of anime I've ever seen. It's, it's, there is something about it that is just so phenomenally singular. Um, and it is, it has become in the year since we watched Haruhi, this like yardstick I measure other episodes by is particularly in that mode. Obviously, you know, some shows like, you know, Myriad Colors Phantom World does not aspire to have a Someday in the Rain, nor should it, because that would be weird for that show. But like with Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, there's one, there's a Yamamura Takia one from season one uh, that is the the New Year's Festival. And I got halfway through that and I went, oh my god, this this is Yamamura Takia's Someday in the Rain. I don't think it's quite as good as that, but like, it's got that feeling to it. And it's just this benchmark that I keep coming back to um, and I think about all the time. So... Yeah, there's lots of other fantastic episodes. Like you said, Kigami Yoshiji episodes. Pretty much any time they brought, you know, Yasuhiro Takamoto onto a show that he was not otherwise heavily involved with and had him pinch hit, like in Love, Chinibu, and Other Delusions, it's usually the best episode of that show. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Also, Shad, like, Hyoka has a bunch of episodes that feel like they would be in contention yeah. for this for me. Like, the last episode of Hyoka is fucking incredible. Um, the the Kitano Hara no Yuki one with the helicopter and the, the teacher yes. who went up to the... Like all that, like that, if they go to the library, that episode is just amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's QAnnie. There are so many really good ones, but Someday in the Rain is it's 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 the episode. And, and you know what? Since I've said some mean things about Sound Euphonium, I want to stress. I think episode eight of Sound Euphonium season one, the Haruka Fujita yes. one, where they go up the mountain, that is one of the best QAnnie. That is in the top five or ten. It's yes. phenomenal. That is also up there for me. I also wrote down here, Sean, favorite character and favorite voice performance, but I realize I'm not sure those are completely separable. So I'm wondering if you have any immediate thoughts on that. That's hard. <laughs> yeah, that's really that's hard. hard. I know. 
Um, I mean, for like, like taking it from the favorite voice performance perspective, I mean, there's a lot. Um, yeah. I mean, one that jumps out immediately to me is Sugita as um, Kion in Haruhi yeah. is just a legendary performance, particularly in Disappearance, but th all throughout, because that's just such a heavy load for an actor, <laughs> you know, especially when he was so young doing that. It's one of his first starring roles. Um, and Kion is so, so, so demanding. Um, I think that one is a really big standout for me. I think another really big standout for me is Ishikawa Yui as Violet and Violet Evergarden, I think are probably like okay. the two I would pick off the top of my head, not having, because I didn't know we were going to do these questions, so I didn't think about these at all. Those are the two I'll just immediately off the top of my head that stand out as like my two favorites. Obviously, there's a million others, Hiro Aya as Haruhi and Konata. If you just take those yes. as a fucking pair for Haruhi and Lucky Star, I mean, that's also... Um, incredible. There are a lot. Um, and take any Nakamura Yuchi character as well. Um, yes. My, my favorite being, not the most important one, but my favorite Nakamura Yuchi performance in, in the QA show, honestly, is actually Hashimoto from Sound Euphonium, the drum teacher. I fucking love that drum <laughs> teacher. It's not a big character. It's obviously not actually asking depth like Okazaki from um, Klanad or Oreki from Hyoka. But at the same time, like there's there's no other character we watched that I smiled so hard every time he popped up on screen, even if it was only like twice at a season. Um, I mean, there's so many, and and the thing I love about QAnny is they you know they brought so many of those actors back to play different kinds of characters in weird and interesting ways throughout you know the decade plus of shows that we've watched, and there's so many recurring actors doing so many interesting things. But if I were to elevate two, it would probably be Suita and Ishikawa Yui. Okay. I'm going to give you five. I'm going to give okay. you a top five that isn't quite ranked. For th three that are not my number one, I have, I have a tie for number one. The other three, I would say Sugita is Kion, absolutely is one of those. I would say um, Asami Sanada as Sawako-chan sensei from Kion. Because uh -huh. she's the best. So Sawachan sensei as they yes. call her, but uh, Sawako, the teacher, fucking love her. Also from Kion, I'm going to Aki Toyosaki as um, uh, Yui, uh, Yui Hirasawa, who is just the most adorable protagonist, and Yui is perfect, and so I'm going Yui. And tied for number one, it's my favorite character in vocal performance, is I'm going Mizuho Nagashima as Akira Kogami and Minoru Shiraishi as oh, himself yeah. from Lucky Star. I think, uh, and, and specifically from Lucky Channel, I think Akira and Minoru are, uh, you know, they might be the characters who live in my head most rent-free, most powerfully from the whole KyoAni experience. And Minoru Shiraishi just deserves some kind of like lifetime yes. achievement award at KyoAni for all they've put him through. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and then also him as, uh, you know, it's their roles in, in Ichijo are so good. Yes. Um, yeah, I, and for, for Kaon, like, I just, for me, it's like, that's the after-school tea time. It's just a set. I mean, it's, it's everybody that's in fair. Kaon. They yeah. all just like sort of... You know, Toyo Sakiaki as, as Yui obviously is a huge standout, but all of them, especially because they were all basically newcomers, um, were so good in that show. Um, yeah. But yes, I mean, there's just countless. And, you know, we don't want to forget Tsuro Kodyota, who was the sound director for every single show we watched. Yes. Um, who, you know, he was the, you know, obviously you would have the regular director of the show usually there as well. But, you know, the sound director is one of the people who's one of their main responsibilities is directing the voice actors um, or being one of the people directing the voice actors. And that's one of those crazy roles in, in production that we didn't talk about a lot because it's like, well, what is there to say? He's just it's the same guy every single time in literally every single show. Um, so, you know, shout out to, if you know, him and the work that he and his team did, because that's how you get such consistently amazing performances from all the these people who are new to voice acting going all the way back to air through to like Miss Kobayashi's Maid Dragon had so many people who are basically newcomers um, it all giving such good performances and that goes down to the directors being so good immense immense talent and I agree should not be forgotten when you when you just think of how many careers were launched in these shows um, it's exactly what you're saying and I'm really glad you brought his name up again those were the favorites I had thought of are there favorite silly favorites you want to go through um, I hadn't I hadn't have anything prepared. I don't know. I think my favorite, my silly favorites is my other idea that I came up with that we haven't done yet, um, which is, Jonathan, I want to create a QA drinking game. Oh, let's do it. I want to create, this is just a list of like, what are the like weird cliches? What are the things that like, you know, we've watched a lot of QA shows and they have, there's such a particular style and there are certain kinds of shots or things in QA that you just see done and reused and reconfigured in different ways across their different shows. 
Um, so I want to just create a drinking game of what are the kinds of cliches we notice that if you saw it in a show, you could take a shot and then be dead by the end of watching that show uh, because they <laughs> pop up so much. And I'll give uh, here's I'll give one to start with, which is a, a good example is um, anytime there's a scene where characters are talking and they're waiting at a stoplight and there's a shot of the stoplight being red and they're talking and then it goes green when their conversation finishes. Obviously, Kitanohara Noriyuki did those a lot, and that's kind of like the thing. The first time we noticed them was in that one Hyoka episode, where it's used so well at the end of the Hyoka episode, where they go to the library and all that. Um, but it pops up all the time. Um, it was in, particularly in anything that's like like Sound Euphonium uses it constantly. Um, so that's one of mine. A corollary to that, because this is also very much a Kitanohara thing, but everyone at QAnnie does it a little bit. I'm going to go with odd slash unconventional slash dynamic angles in a cafe while people are talking yes. having coffee yeah does that and, make sense yes well because there's there's a few things i think we could create like a subcategory for this one because there's a few here um that different directors do different things so one this is the katana Hada one is the like using how much they've eaten to pass time in the scene Right. Yes. Like we've noticed that on, in multiple different ones of those scenes where it's like they're having a pie or something and it keeps cutting back to and now like the pie is half eaten. Now it's three quarters eaten. Um, that's one. Um, another Face one. Face reflected in the coffee surface. Yes. This is the Takimori Yashiro one. Um, it's yes. usually going to be in a diner or a cafe. Um, some, and it was one of the things that was fun with any of his sound euphonium episodes, though, it was always the euph euphonium. And there's, uh, there's every one of Takimoto's sound euphonium episodes is a shot of Kimiko looking down at herself in her own reflection of the euphonium when there's a moment of like personal crisis. It's she's do self-reflection. Oraki from Hyoka, an expert of staring down at his tea or his coffee while he is thinking about something. Um... I'm going to go with a low angle from side of table showing top of legs and bottom of torso. They yep. love those shots. There's a specifically one of Chitanda in the like second episode of Hyoka that I remember very vividly, but it is a, that is an angle they like. It is a camera angle that feels very physical, but that you actually might be slightly hard to get with a real camera because of placement. Um, the tripods aren't usually built at that weird height. So yeah. Yeah. And this, this, is both in these moments and it also is more broadly. Um, it's kind of, you know, a thing that they do a lot at this sometimes in the cafe scenes is like long shots focusing on very particular details in the environment, like statues. Um, yeah. And so it's like in, in Harahi, you know, they have their one little cafe and there's the little like, I think it was like a luchador looking guy um, with like a sombrero or something. And that was like on the banisters and they do lots of shots focusing on those. You, of course, have on all the different schools. There's always some statue at the school, like um, for uh, Sound Euphonium, it's the statue with the doves that it's letting go of, that there are like lots of long loving shots are super detailed on those kinds of statues. Um, that that's just one that QNE loves to do, do their like location shooting and then find a really cool, weird physical fixture in the environment and use that as a way to do cool, interesting establishing shots. 100%. I put that as its own thing because I think that is bigger than just the cafe scenes. Yes. But with the cafe scenes, I'm also going to go as a corollary to how much they've eaten to pass time in a scene, um, repeated cuts back to a clock on the wall because yes. they do that as well. Um, all right, getting away from these, I'm going to give you one, Sean. Flawless animation of a very complicated musical performance. Yes. <laughs> because that is something all the way from, I mean, frankly, you could argue for some of the dance stuff in Kanon, but from, you know, God Knows in Haruhi, where you go, Jesus, where'd that come from? And then it just becomes a regular thing in k and Sound Euphonium and all sorts of other shows. Yes, I mean, eventually they made an entire show that basically was about this to the point that they could yes. no longer keep doing it, basically. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, that's so, a very good that's one. one. Um, there's, so I think there's like a few we can do about different shots they use for the sky. Like one, let's just like get this one out. The Taka Noriko cloud, right? The, the cloud of death. I don't know what we want to call it. Um, right. Yes. Um, that's one. The other one that this to me is like, this might be the most quintessential QA shot of all time is a shot of the sky with a jet 
leaving a trail cutting yes. across the sky. Like that's just in everything. Um, down to, you know, even like most recently in Sound Euphonium 3, that's a really prominent shot in the episode where they go to the swimming pool where Mayu takes a picture of it on her physical camera. And the last shot of that episode is the Polaroid like image of that shot of this jet trail cutting across the blue sky on her desk. Um, it is so funny to me that that is so consistently a visual motif that they go back to over and over and over again in every single show. Absolutely. It's, I mean, it's part of the, the whole revelation scene in the end of the endless eight is like yes. sky imagery like that. Um, obviously tying in the cloud of death as well. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, oh man, there's so many we could do for this. Um, I'm thinking, okay, here's a, here's, here's one, um, unbelievably fluid animation of hair, f uh, swaying in the breeze. Yes. Now, this is the drinking game item that will kill you fastest because it is in every episode of every show they've ever made, but it is such a kill anything. Yes. Yeah. Uh, honestly, it might be the one thing that, like, Beyond the Boundary, like, might do best is uh -huh. it's got some of the best hair in the breeze animation in the whole kill any canon. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, sh sequence of characters walking by the road at night illuminated by passing car headlights. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, yeah, illuminated by passing headlights. Uh, that is a that is a super frequent one. They love those scenes. Yeah, I mean, all honestly, the way back to Harahi, you know, they just it's so good. Well, it's something we've talked about a lot. They tend, again, some of their shows are based on manga, but they tend to gravitate towards visual novels or light novels or just novel novels in the case of Hyoka for their source material. And so they tend to go towards stuff that is not super visual in its base form, right? Like Haruhi, I, like when you go back to the history of Haruhi, you know, Yasumoto Take, not, uh, um, Tatsuya Ishihara, his first reaction to reading the books, he said, was like, I don't know if this can be an anime. Yeah. And when you read the Haruhi books, you understand they are so verbal. They are machine gun dialogue, like just rat-a-tat-tat. Um, and it is all this internal narration. And so, so much of what QAnon shows are is finding ways to take things that do not feel inherently cinematic or even inherently necessary to be animated, right? Um, and then finding a way to make them unbelievably visual dy visually dynamic. I think of like, it's one of the later episodes in the Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya arc, those like first six episodes, where it is Kyon and uh, the Esper guy sitting in the back of the car, having their long conversation about uh -huh. Espers. And it goes on and on and on, but it is like visually arresting. And like in anyone else's hands, that scene would slow the show to a crawl. But like half of what we're talking about in this drinking game is the things they've developed as a studio to make scenes that are not inherently cinematic, very cinematic. Yeah, and there, there are scenes that like, if you watch a lot of anime, you know, like 90% of anime or whatever is set in like a contemporary Japanese high school, right? Um, and yeah. so you're, you constantly have these kinds of scenes in whatever shows you're watching in modern anime. You're constantly having scenes of people sitting around in the classroom talking, people sitting around at a cafe talking or the cafeteria at school or people walking home from school or walking to school, right? Um, and those are just like, you just get used to those scenes being very cookie cutter in most shows that you watch. And QAnon, even though they're, you know, you know, they're they're doing the same kinds of shows in terms of the genres they cover is generally fairly limited. Every once in a while you get a Violet Evergarden that goes a bit more adventurous. But, you know, it's a pretty similar kinds of shows in the overall scope of possible fiction you could create. But they find these ways to bring so much artistry and creative visual ingenuity to these kinds of sequences um and, and and like having the well let's do let's have the headlights pass by and use the lighting of the cars passing by to illuminate the scene but then also to create like interesting contrasts and dynamics with the light in the scene that usually will also communicate something about what's happening with the characters like one of the best ones of these they just did in sound euphonium season three where you have the motomu episode where um kumiko talks to him um, at night and they're standing and a car comes by on like a curve and comes around the curve and the lights like play across their face as she kind of helps him come to terms and come to peace with um, what's happened with his sister and all that stuff that, that that episode story is about and the way that the light plays across those characters as he is sort of like spiritually saved in that way it's so emotionally powerful because the story is visually communicating those ideas using the lighting 
it's kind of like if you think of like with American live action TV, you know, most TV is shot for conversations, for coverage of just get, you know, this person's side, get that person's side, and then the editor will figure it out in the edit. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that is, uh, TV is often had, you know, you have to shoot it fast. So that's how you do it. But then like you watch something like Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul or Hannibal or something like that, where like the most mundane scenes are shot with like this level of visual ingenuity and cinematic storytelling that are arresting. And it feels like of a, of a different caliber. That's KyoAni versus yes. it's exactly the kind of thing you're describing. I came up with another one while you were talking though for a drinking game, Sean, otherwise mundane setting suddenly turns into the greatest sports anime slash shonen battle anime of all time. Yes. Uh, yeah, going back to the like basketball and baseball scenes of Clannad in particular, yes. where that fucking baseball scene for the first episode of Clannad After Story is still, I still, still think about um, that shot of the camera, like the quote unquote camera being on the outer edge of the baseball as it's being thrown and spinning. Yes. It's like, fucking Jesus Christ. I put it in our theme song for the, the first half of the season because it's such a good shot. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. No, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we could also call that item, Sean, Kyoani flexing and telling you they could make the greatest sports anime or shown in battle anime of all time. They're just never going to. Yeah. <laughs> Which is basically the subtitle of Nichi Joe. Nichi Joe, we could make the greatest shown in battle anime of all time, but we want to make a really silly comedy. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, it very much is part of their overall style. Um, here's Here's one. The first and or last shot of the show being cherry blossoms. <laughs> yeah, this this is just a side effect of so many of the shows being school shows. So the year begins in spring and then the next school year begins in spring. Um, and so it's just, you know, there was a string of like four or five shows in a row that we watched. It was like Nietzsche Joe was one. Uh, all of like both seasons of Kaon, I'm pretty sure Tomica Market. Um, Love Chinibu and Other Delusions, that all of them started with basically the same shot. I mean, they were literally the same shot, but, you know, the same conceptual shot of the bud of a cherry blossom on a tree and it's slowly opening up. And it's like, yep, we're constantly starting in the spring. I mean, it's a great, you know, visual metaphor for your shows. It's one of the reasons why we have shows set in Japanese high schools. Um, it makes me, like, always confused why the American schools don't start in spring like why do we have the beginning of the school year be in fall it was like metaphorically it's the whole it's a whole thing spring it's the new beginning it's all that kind of stuff um and they just use it to good effect in q and &E shows absolutely here's one i don't really know what to call it sean other than reality completely snaps <laughs> like the moments like you know basically anything on lucky channel and lucky star a lot of stuff in nichi joe but there's like there's also moments like I don't know the end of the Lucky Channel the Lucky Star OVA. There's moments obviously in Haruhi where these things happen where just something breaks into the show in a way that just feels like oh my god the reality of this thing just snapped in half. Yeah, yeah, and there's like the comedic versions of that, but there are also like dramatic versions because like one thing I thought of when you said that was the scene in Tamako love story where Tamako gets confessed to, and then she runs home and the background melts away and turns into crazy yes. watercolors that they definitely do that kind of thing as well. Particularly Yamada Naoko. Um, and like the, like, even though the most of their stuff is shot in a way to make it feel very grounded and, and quote unquote, like practical, um, real film in like real cameras that every once in a while you will get this moment where that just sort of breaks in something and, impossible and sort of animated occurs in that world um and yeah. yeah that's 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 a good one okay here's one kigami yoshiji water animation let's just do that <laughs> yes. just oh, across all these shows yeah there's a billion it could be tears it can be a stream it can be you know a waterfall anything just those moments where you look at the water and go well that we know who that had to be yes. <laughs> right yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's that's definitely a very good one. Um that is one of the deadlier items on our list frankly if you're doing the drinking game. Yes. Yeah, that's that one's going to kill you. It's it's you know every other episode or so you're going to get some sort of impossible shot of like, you know, a, like shooting through the fucking bottle of water as it's like shaking with the music. It's, yeah, it's that's the whole thing. Um oh, here's one. Dramatic scenes of characters standing under an awning reflected in a puddle of rain. <laughs> Yes, that's so true. Uh, there's a lot of those. Yeah, that's definitely a talking with Yes Hero one. He had several episodes uh, where you, you'd have those. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I you know, and there's there's ones obviously for individual shows like 
you could still die from this drinking game if we just put glasses fetish jokes on here because by the end of Beyond the Boundary, there, no other show has a joke about that. Yeah. You watch all the other Kearney shows, you'd be fine. But Beyond the Boundary, you would kill your liver by the end of that show. It's, it's true. That's 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 too dangerous of a one. It would be irresponsible yeah. to put it on here because it's, yeah, because someone would be watching through and be like, why is this on this drinking game thing? This doesn't make sense. And then, you know, they don't even realize that happened and be on the boundary because they're dead before they even yeah. noticed. This one really only applies to the first couple years of their shows, but I do think uh, Full Metal Panic Fumofu in jokes is like a weirdly <laughs> common thing yes. early on. <laughs> right? Yes. It, yeah. Any of their sort of like, yeah, 2000s era shows for sure. Um, yeah, weird Fumo Panic, Fumo Fu and jokes. And then it gets brought back when we did cover the show, but Takuma yeah, talk about Yasuhiro directs Amagi Brilliant Park, which is based on a light novel series by Shoji Gato, who's the Full Metal Panic guy. And there's a million of them in that, including one of the characters just being <laughs> the Fumo Fu mascot um, from Fumo Fu. So, yeah. And this is a good one. This one actually is better than I thought it was yeah. for that reason. You have yeah. the, the best one, of course, is that the episode of Hadahi where they go into the computer and and they're like <laughs> fighting the giant ant or whatever. And and one character like spikes the energy ball and it's like, Fumafu. And, and then the, uh, the other one just jumps up and goes, Second Raid! And hits it. And they're the subtitles. They're full metal panic shows. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's good. So good. Oh, this is weird. I just reminded, I was reminding by what you saying that of like, I need to go get some Full Metal Panic Blu-rays. And so I searched on the Crunchyroll store. And when I searched Full Metal Panic, I got a solid page of Full Metal Alchemist books. Come on, Crunchyroll. If I could fix that. Full yeah. Metal Panic is spelled as Full Metal with a, uh, with a break in the middle. Full Metal Alchemist is one word. This is bullshit. Fix your algorithm. Yes. Full Metal Panic is right. very good. It's worth watching. Yes. Absolutely. Um, boy, there's so many. Uh, I mean... You know, this there's there's also like you know let's say Tatsuya uh, Ishihara theme songs where there's a border around the image like that's yes, just something yeah. he loves to do right yes yeah that that's yeah. a good one <laughs> um, and there's obviously broad ones but th- at a certain point this just becomes all of them I was gonna say like you know uh, moe character driven end songs where all the cute girls sing together but that's kind of all of them so I don't know if that's yes. fair yeah. Um... yeah. But yeah, that that that, it, that is a good point with the Ishiata's borders around. It, it's very true. Um, well, he, it's it's because he develops that in the key shows, and that's kind of a visual novel thing. Yes, but he starts using it then on on all his later shows as well, like Love Chinibio, Sound Euphonium, all of these. Yeah. Oh, this is giant boob jokes, not sure. sexual necessarily, just about the awkwardness of the human body. Yeah, I mean, it only pops up at a few shows, but, you know, it, it pops up. You know, you get... I don't know if this would count all the way there, but, I mean, you also get that a little bit with, like, Kumiko and Sound Euphonium, who's, you know, sort of, like, her commenting on, like, her own development in that area. Yeah. Um, but, of course, you have Mirror Color Phantom World and Miss Kobayashi's Made yes. Dragon to really cover those for you. Yes. I, again, that's only a couple of shows, but it does cross... A, it crosses enough shows that I think it, it belongs on here. It's not like the glasses fetish thing where it's just one show did it. Yeah. I mean, you'll get a little bit of that in Haruhi with uh, Haruhi yes. teasing Mikudu. So yeah, it, it pops yeah. up here and there. The, in Haruhi, it is meant to also be slightly disturbing because yes. Haruhi is being a, a massive asshole <laughs> to poor Mikudu. But, you know, oh, yeah. that's how it goes. <laughs> All right. Any others for our for our drinking game? I think I think we've we've got it. I mean, obviously, there's there's lots of like other like little ones that wouldn't really work across. You know, like things like uh, the ending is composed by Zach, which is true of like every show <laughs> they made since like 2012 yes. or something. Um, you know, but but that's like not a thing that happens multiple times in a show. It's just what the ending is. All right. Well, then you want to recap these really quickly for the people if they sure. want to play along with their own QNE drinking game. We've got scene where characters talk while waiting at a stoplight. All right. We've got um. Uh, the whole I'm just going to do all the series of these are all the things that people do at cafes any of these you have to take a shot Uh, showing how much they've eaten to pass uh, time in the scene repeated cuts back to a clock on the wall a face reflected in the coffee surface or it could be tea Um, and then low angle from side of table showing top of legs and bottom of torso long takes focusing on very particular details in the environment like statues for instance yes Um, a flawless animation of a very complicated musical performance Sky shots, such as Takao Noriko's Cloud of Death, or Sky with a Jet leaving a trail in its wake. Unbelievably fluid animation of hair swaying in the breeze. 
Sequence of characters walking down the road at night illuminated by passing headlights. Otherwise mundane setting suddenly turns into the greatest sports anime or shonen battle anime of all time. First and or last shot of the show being cherry blossoms blooming. Reality completely snaps, uh, either in a comedic way or in a dramatic way. Kigami Yoshiji water animation. Dramatic scenes of characters standing under an awning reflected in a puddle of rain. Full Metal Panic Fumofu in jokes. Ishara Tatsuya theme songs with a border around the image. And giant boob jokes. Not sexual, necessarily, just about the inherent awkwardness of the human body. There you go. I'm glad we ended on that one. It feels like that really <laughs> encompasses the, the, the heart of QAnity. <laughs> Well, you know, it is, I mean, it's a, it's a weird thing to talk about, but it is in, a, in an anime landscape where we know what that joke usually looks like, uh -huh. and it is more of a fan service -y kind of thing. I do think it is notable in something like Myriad Colors or Miss Kobayashi, how much it is like a little kid laughing about it. It is childlike and innocent, and, and you know, it can be funny in that way. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I think this is the perfect topic to end our 32 episode season on Kyoto Animation uh, is the giant boob animation. Sean, give us something else to talk about to elevate the end of this for a little bit here. I just, you know, I just, I just, Kyoto is really good, you know? I'm just like, God damn, you know, they're good. Reflecting yeah. back on, on all of this, it's just, I'm, I'm, the, one, the thing I'm really excited about is that we didn't actually watch everything. So I feel like, yes. personally, I can just go, you know, I'm really excited to watch Free in Sudan. You know, I want to get some sexy boys swimming. I want to get some sexy boys doing archery. I need some of that in my life. Um, it's just, and I'm, I'm, I guess the other thing is I'm just also so excited for what QAnity does in the future. You know, obviously yeah. there's, you know, the tragedy of the arson attack. Um, but, you know, for me personally, as someone who has a huge amount of love for Sound Euphonium Season 3, you know, put Jonathan and his weird fucking hangups aside, um, as, as someone who walks the righteous path of loving Sound Euphonium 3, um, I'm very excited to see where they go next because it feels like a very open feel, you know, like Sound Euphonium 3 was something still hanging over the studio from before the arson attack happened. It was a project that they had in early development that then was put on hold and then now is finished and i'm curious to see what like ishara tatsuya does next i'm curious to see what like ishidate taichi who's not directed something since by regarding the movie like i wonder if he's working on a show obviously he's done episodes for like sudan and stuff that they've done since but i'm curious if he's working on his own new show um i'm just so curious to see what the studio does next and then also to go um watch some of the stuff that the people who left have done like yamada naoko in her stuff which I have not seen her post Q any works and her do movie that's out soon, you know, um, going in, like going back to Taco Noriko and going and finally, I need to fucking watch Idol Master because she went off and made all that Idol Master stuff. And I got to know, <laughs> I got to know. Is the cloud there? Yeah. Yeah. I have to, is, is, does she, did she put the cloud in there? Um, you know, because it's the thing with Kiraini is that it's exciting to trace what they're going to do in the future and see what the next sort of step step in this big giant journey is but then also all the people that they helped sort of bring up and raise artistically in this industry who have gone off to do other things or join other studios like Fujita Haruka I'm curious what her next big project eventually is going to be she's done work at different places like she did a lot of work on uh, Free Road Beyond Journey's End I hope that eventually she gets to direct another movie or TV show or something like that um, there's just so many incredible artists, both at QAnity and who have been touched by QAnity and gone on to other things um, that we you know our Kyoto vacation is coming to an end, but QAnity is not done. Um, and that's the thing that's most exciting. Uh, no, absolutely not. And, and they have not been, you know, broken by that arson attack. They have yeah. still put out a lot of stuff. Their, their output has slowed, obviously. Um, and most of what they've done since has been things that existed before the attack, like the second season of Tsurune and of Kobayashi and San Euphonium 3. Um, but I, I'm so excited to see what, like, what's the next big original work they do? You know, what is the next thing that we don't see coming from them? Um, because they have, they have also, is something we traced this season, they have reinvented themselves several times over. You know, um, they have a, that early period that is extremely distinctive. And then they have other periods that, like, like part of the splendid isolation part of the season, as you called it, with the light novel adaptations, was them kind of trying to find what was the next gear. And, you know, one of the things that ultimately comes out of that is Violet Evergarden, which is in many ways 
quite a different show for them. Um, it's emotionally got a similar tenor, but it's a different genre in a lot of ways and, and all of that. So, so I'm constantly, yeah, I, I want to see what else they do. I like you have a stack of Blu-rays I've bought for things we didn't have for this season. I have Surine, I have free, I have Amagi brilliant park. I want to, you know, I think full metal panic might just be a mini season. We do at some point. Cause that would be fun. But, um, you know, I want to see all of these. Yeah. I will say I had not seen full metal panic second raid before we started doing the Q and E, uh, our Q and E vacation. Um, but I, that, you know, it's one of the things I watched in secret while, along the way, just cause I wanted to watch other Q and E stuff. Full metal panic. The second raid is fucking great. So yeah, we should do oh, good. full metal panic. See like the original show. That's the one not made by Q and E is very good. Not great. Fumofu is very inconsistent. Second raid fucking kicks so much ass. So, and I have not seen the third season, which is not made by Q and E. So yeah, that might be a thing we do someday. Um, is, is wrap back around to that. And then maybe, you know, pick up some of these other, Q and A things along the way, or whatever next show they do. Um, I'm sure we are not done covering Q and or Q and related stuff on Japanimation Station. But we're done for now because <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been a journey. So, Sean, should we uh, go ahead and tell everyone what is happening in the future on Japanimation Station? Yes. Yeah, so it looks, Jonathan, like we've got a couple of one-off episodes coming up. Why don't you tell the folks yes. what those are? Yeah, so this will be the basically the next two weeks. This episode is coming out on September first. We will be we will have two more episodes not Kyoto Animation related in the next two weeks before we kind of sign off for a little bit here and work on the next full season. But these are things we know people have wanted. First off, next week, yes, it's happening finally. The Weekly Suit Gundam episode on Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Freedom because that is coming out on Netflix today, the day this releases on September first, and so everybody can see. It. It's already on Netflix in Japan, but it'll be on Netflix worldwide with subtitles and uh, presumably the dub, and so people can watch it. And I have already seen that movie. You didn't. You weren't able to see it in theaters, so yes. people have kept asking us for the episode. Um, and so we will be doing that next week and talking about uh, the end of Mobile Suit Gundam Seed. 20 years after the last piece of Gundam Seed. Uh, I like this movie a lot, and I'm excited to talk about yeah. it. I'm I'm very excited to finally see it, because, you know, it just came... That movie was in theaters for, like, one day on a school night. <laughs> it's, like, yes. it's like, it's just not particularly doable in the middle of, like, what it was, like, late April or something. It was just not not feasible um, um, for me at the time to just, like, go see that in the theater. So I'm very excited to finally be able to watch it, Um you know, as the, as the resonant like Gundam Seed like lover, the guy. I mean, you like Gundam Seed as well, but I, you know, really really love Seed, and you liked Seed Freedom a lot, right, Jonathan? I liked it a lot, and honestly, around that same time, I didn't finish it, but I did start a rewatch of the original Gundam Seed, and it was exactly what I thought was going to happen when we recorded the Gundam Seed episode years ago. Was that when I, whenever I rewatched it, I knew I was going to like it more, and mm -hmm. I very much did. So I think, um, and and honestly, that the magic trick of freedom is also that it kind of redeems destiny, and there's like not necessarily to the point where it makes every crazy decision of destiny quote unquote worth it, but it makes it easier to swallow the the pill of the middle of the story being bad so i'm i'm very much excited to watch that with you and, and talk yeah. about it i'm i'm incredibly excited because i've also been listening to the theme song and the ending theme from that movie forever. So good. <laughs> i put them on my ma playlist forever ago and so it's like i'm very familiar with those two songs um i'm very i'm excited That's... to finally be able to see them in context the soundtrack to that movie is phenomenal, Sean. It is so good. See, I mean, we always thought Seed had good music, but God, because it's the same composer, but 20 years later, so good. Uh, and we will also do an episode on uh, the week after that on Kimetsu no Yaiba season four, the Hashira training season that we wanted to do an episode on when it aired, but it was just in the middle of like seven other things we were doing, yeah. including wrapping up the weekly stuff podcast. So we didn't get to talk about it. We're going to be a little late to the party, but we've, we've got episodes on every other piece of Kimetsu no Yaiba demon slayer. So we want to have that uh, as we prepare for the fucking infinite castle movie trilogy that yes. we were asking for that they are making. How exciting is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. I and I really want to see this season as well because I've heard good things about it, and it sounds like it just gets to expand on what is a pretty small part of the manga. Yeah. I was curious, you know, and I'm I'm curious to see like where do they expand on this sort of like little breather before you get into the giant last arc. And it's basically a full season. It, I thought it would be shorter, but it's like eight or nine episodes, and the premiere and the finale are both double length, so it's basically a full core. Yes, it's that classic crazy. UFO table thing where you look at the number of episodes, but it, that does not tell you how long the season is. It's nope. like when watching <laughs> Unlimited Blade works, and you're like, this is like 32 episodes or something if you put it all together. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. But then... 
we're going to take a break while we work on season five. And for season five, we were thinking, we had a lot of ideas for what season five would be. But I think at a certain point we realized we spent so much time in Kyoto. We were on that Kyoto vacation for so long, Sean, that instead of diving into another deep dive onto one thing that we would do for a long time, we needed some variety. We needed some spice in our lives. We needed to go on a grand tour through some anime. And so season five is Japanimation Station Grand Tour. It is a 12 episode season where Sean and I each picked five shows to review couple of two-parters thrown in here um and we basically just the rules were we could pick anything the other person just kind of had to agree with it and uh they had to be a certain length but that was basically it um and we picked some exciting stuff yes i mean i'm i'm very excited for most of these things uh there's there's maybe one part of it i'm I'm a little bit less excited to watch um uh but but yes it, it it began life as the variety pack of yes let's just sort of there's all these shows that we want to be able to cover on japanimation station um that don't clearly fit into an easy topic that like you can do a whole season on but are just like hey we could just watch this one show or maybe watch these two seasons of a show and be able to just cover that um and so why not kind of smash that all together into one fun kind of grab bag season of things and so we each pick the same number of shows each of us have a two-parter um, but generally speaking, we're, you know, get a kind of bounce between shows that Jonathan has chosen to uh, see. One of them he's, he's forcing me to see. Um, and then mine, which are all games. Yes. All right. So here's the schedule for this upcoming season. Here's your anime homework for the next season. Parts. Uh, so episodes one and two of our grand tour, we will be reviewing Dragon Ball GT, the 1997 anime classic sequel to Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. We will be doing it in two halves. We'll do everything up through the end of the baby arc for part one and everything with Super 17 and the evil dragon arc for part two, along with the, the special in the movie related to Dragon Ball GT. Um, this GT is an easy show to find. There's some really good torrents recently that have the Dragon Box footage, but color corrected. That's very worth worthwhile and uh you know with dragon ball daima coming on this october and again going back to the idea of goku being a kid again again using katsuyoshi nakatsuru as their character designer i felt like now was the time to to do an academic look at dragon ball gt yeah and to make it very explicitly clear jonathan has chosen to do this this was not my <laughs> choice i did not say let's do dragon ball gt um and i will i will watch it and, and we will we'll discuss it you know i I the last time I tried to watch GT, I could not make it all the way through it. So now the uh, now the podcast will force me to. Indeed, uh, I've already watched the first four episodes. I'm having fun. I've not been able to bring myself to watch it yet. <laughs> You're gonna have to at some I'll point. Get there. All right, I'll get there. All right. Our third episode is your first pick. What is it, Sean? Yes. So my the first episode I've chosen for our third in the season is going to be Welcome to the NHK from 2006. This is a two-course, a 24-episode show that's based on a novel. Um, this is a show that I watched forever ago and really, really liked it and thought it was fascinating and have wanted to go back and revisit it for a long time. I just remember the show having a couple of story arcs that really stood out to me as being really really interesting it's just very different and unlike um other shows i had seen um and also has just one of my favorite anime soundtracks ever and that's going to be something fun to revisit that show is uh on crunchyroll um and, and if you have an old dvd like i do from funimation you can watch it that way as well yes uh the dvd is super duper like expensive out of print because i looked it up um but it is on crunchyroll luckily so that's that's it's not good. out of print if you bought it eight years ago <laughs> True. Uh, our fourth episode, this is one you are going to have to pirate because it does not exist in any official form. And that is the 1998 Toei Yu-Gi-Oh! series. The 27 episode first attempt to animate Yu-Gi-Oh! by Toei. This is the one where Kaiba has green hair. This is the one where Yugi is voiced by Megumi Ogata, this Shinji Ikari himself. Well, the act is an actress, but you get it. Um, it's 27 episodes in one short movie. It has never been available worldwide. The only release of it ever commercially was VHSs in Japan. So you're going to have to track down a torrent with fan subs. There are some good recent ones. There's a group called Berek Scrubs, B-E-R-E-K-E -E -E Scrubs, that did a recent um, VHS torrent that is the best looking and translated version I've seen. So go look for that. But this has always been, this show has always fascinated me, but I've never actually made myself watch it. And I'm going to make Sean do it with me. 
I'm very excited for this one. Like this is one that yeah. you know, partially because I've, I've never seen it, so I don't know. Like maybe maybe I'll think it's bad. I have no idea. But I've always liked a lot the early Yu Gi Oh manga stuff. Like that's yeah. the only part of the manga I've read is all the like the weird earlier stuff. Um, and I've never I never actually followed the manga through to the, the parts that people think of when you think of Yu Gi Oh, which is like Pegasus and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. I'm very excited um, to to watch this because it is a show that's kind of felt legendary particularly over here because it's just not had no access to it. It's obviously completely overshadowed by it's much better known, a much more popular version of Yu-Gi-Oh that you think of when you think of Yu-Gi-Oh the anime. So I'm very excited to see that one. Yeah. Yeah. So then after that is going to be one of my choices um, where we are going to be covering the series Dodoro, D-O-R-O-R-O, an adaptation of one of Osamu Tezuka's manga. We're going to be doing both versions. So one episode is going to be on the 1969 TV series, which will be the first time we have ever covered black and white anime on Japan Animation Station. Yes. Um, there's really not that much black and white anime in the big scheme of things either. So, you know, who knows? We'll come back to that again. Um, but it is... I'm very excited because I've never seen that black and white version, but we'll be covering that. Um, and then we will be doing the more modern version that people might have seen because it was quite popular. The 2019 adaptation of Dodo, Do, um, which that one is available on High Dive in Amazon Prime, um, or you can get the Blu-ray from Sentai um, Filmworks. And that it's a very fascinating series. I've always loved this story of Hyakimaru and Dodo. Do. It's so cool. Um, the original manga was never fully finished. And so it's kind of... It's cool to see the 2019 TV show interpretation of kind of where that goes. And I'm interested to see what the original TV adaptation does, because I know that it kind of goes to different places. Because, again, the, the original manga was never done. So very, very, very excited to go through Dodo Do with you. Me too. I'm, I, there's not a lot of opportunities to talk about two anime based on the same manga produced 50 years apart, yeah. one in black and white and one in color. So I think this is exciting. Um, coincidentally, I also wanted to do a Tezuka thing. And so we putting them together here, the seventh episode, we will be reviewing three films known as the Anime Rama Trilogy from 69 to 73 made by Tezuka's company. Um, I don't think it was Mushi Pro at that point because I think that he had a lot of companies because they yes. kept going under. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it is the films A Thousand and One Nights, Cleopatra, and Belladonna of Sadness, all of which are on Blu-ray from Discotech. Belladonna of Sadness most recently in a 4K Blu-ray combo pack. So that's what we're going to be watching them from. And these are classics of, of frankly, avant-garde anime um, and, a, and an attempt to do adult anime for theaters. And one of the most sort of infamous artistic risks Tezuka took in his career and the people around him, he didn't direct these, but he produced the, at least the first two, he was less involved in Belladonna of sadness but it is still his company um and so i am super excited to do a couple of tezuka episodes here that's fun yes i'm very excited for those that they've, they've always been on my radar as this weird sort of like path not taken you know in the history of anime yes. of like what would this kind of like more adult more kind of sexualized you know sexualized in a different way like very 70s ass movie like what would that be um i'm excited to go see those then after that, our eighth episode is going to be on Azumanga Daio, the classic legendary moe comedy anime from 2002, 26 episodes streaming on High Dive. This is one I picked, figured that we talked about, or I like mentioned Azumanga Daio, I feel like every other episode, Transformation Station for a long time, particularly the yes. early q and days, um, because it was so relevant and it's such an important show and it's fucking hilarious as shit. Um, I've read the whole manga. I have the manga in Japanese. This is actually the first manga I ever read in Japanese was I imported as Manga Daio because it's easy to read because it's just for poor Koma manga. So very excited to rewatch that show um, and just get some good, some good, you know, chuckles in after what's probably going to be. I know Dodo gets pretty dark in places. On my Rama Trilogy is probably going to be very fucking weird. Um, as Manga yeah. Daio, this is going to be funny as shit. Then for the ninth episode, I picked, this is just a classic it's a crowd pleaser. It's one everyone we've asked, been asked about it many times. Uh, Gunbuster, aim for the top. The 1988 OVA that is the first directorial work of Hideaki Anno and the precursor to Neon Genesis Evangelion. Until the rebuild of Eva movies and, and like Shin Godzilla and that stuff, it was my favorite thing he'd ever done. I like Gunbuster a lot. It's streaming on Crunchyroll. Discotech has a Blu-ray. It has a full black and white episode, so more black and white anime. Gunbuster rocks. Yes, I'm very excited to to be able to talk about it. That's one that you taught in your giant mecha class, right? Yeah, so I have some, I have some, so I also just, I have like the notes done for it. I have stories of my students watching it. It's good. Yeah, very excited for that one. 
Um, and then after that, we're coming to another one that there was a long chunk of podcasts we did back in the Lupin season that I feel like I brought yes. up this show about every other episode, which we're going to be doing two episodes on the series Dirty Pair. So episode 10 will be on Dirty Pair season one from 1985. This is streaming on Crunchyroll, so you can check it out there. Or if you have the old DVDs like I do from Fucking Forever Go, if you bought those 20 years ago and you're like, now I finally have an excuse, you can break <laughs> those out. Um, Dirty Pair is so fucking good. Uh, and then we'll be doing a second season for Dirty Pair where we'll be covering season two. Um, and then also the Project, Project Eden movie. Um, there are also some other Dirty Pair OVAs that I think we're not going to cover because there's a lot of like weird ephemera around Dirty Pair. So we're just narrowing it down to those. So just season one and then season two and the Project Eden movie to finally get our 80s anime on with the most 80s anime ever made, which is Dirty Pair. I'm so excited for this one. It's I have so wanted good. to watch it. It's so good. Yeah. All right. And uh, for the 12th and final episode of the season, again, that's a big one people have wanted. It's the one we've wanted to do. Berserk. The 1997 TV series, the uh, uh, the Sword Wind Romance Berserk is its full name in Japanese, but this is the adaptation of the Golden Age arc of Berserk in 25 episodes. It is it has had a resurgence this year because Discotech put out a Blu-ray in North America that I think brought it back into prominence as like this is a masterpiece. I watched it earlier this year and loved it, and I think we just I know you have not seen this version yet, yes. right, Sean? Yeah, I've read the manga, but I have not seen. Um, any of the anime versions so i have the discotheque blu-ray i need to go get a avengers 2 blu-ray so i can have a red blu-ray case to put the <laughs> like swap it out with yes um, i need to go do that trick um but yes i'm i'm very excited to finally watch this because i love berserk and this has been one of the most requested podcast topics i think we've ever had because i mean this yes. predates the animation station of people wanting us to cover something berserk related um and, and, yeah. we're finally... and we can't really do a berserk season because this is the only piece of anime that is, like, universally acclaimed, and there's not enough of the bad anime to make a full season out of, so maybe yeah. we'll revisit it in a future variety pack setting. But for now, like, at, in terms of animation, this is the one that is worth an episode, and we're going to give it an episode. I'm very excited. So, so that's season five. And it'll begin this winter sometime. I'm not entirely sure when. November, December, January. We'll see. We'll let you know. Yes. But it's, next Some year. of it's going to determine, like, how quickly can I watch through Dragon Ball GT? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I put that one first for a reason, Sean. Yes. Um, get, one, because it is attention-grabbing, and I think people will listen to it because it's popular. Uh, even if it's not necessarily universally beloved, people know Dragon Ball. Uh, but also, it is the, it is the Band-Aid to rip off. Yeah, for sure. All right. That'll begin this winter. But next year, in 2025, for season six, we're doing Tomino-a-thon. The time is here, Jonathan. The time is here. This is our long-awaited. Everyone keeps asking for it. We know you want it. We want to do it. We're finally ready. We are going to be doing a season all about the non-Gundam works of Yoshiyuki Tomino. We did all his Gundam works on Weekly Suit Gundam. For season six, we're going to do everything else. We don't have the exact, like plan nailed down because this is a little further out but we know all the big ones obviously we're doing it on we're doing heavy metal l game we're doing uh uh the overman king gainer all the ones you want we're brain doing powered them. yes brain powered all, brain powered the the uh, zambot three where all the yeah. children die at the end we're gonna find all of it we're gonna learn what kind of clinical depression did yoshiyuki tomino have in the 70s and 80s and can we help him now we're gonna find out on tomino a -thon, season six of Japan Animation Station. Yeah, th this is the thing that originally we were going to make before we d did Japan Animation Station. Yes. Um, that was like our original idea for a post weekly suit Gundam. But I, th I like, I feel like it was good that we took some time off, and it'll still will be a little while before we finally get to it. Um, but I am excited. You know, a lot of the Tomino Thon stuff is stuff I have seen, but there's a good chunk of it that I have not seen yet, like Heavy Metal Elkheim. Um, so. You know, we will finally, we'll be able to come home in season six to our beloved Tomino and his crazy mecha nonsense. Absolutely. So thank you guys for sticking with us through this stupidly long fourth season. I just feel like we <laughs> broke the, the idea of the term season here, but season four, our Kyoto vacation, it is done. The plane is about to land back in America. We're going to start watching some Dragon Ball GT and get ready for season five, our grand tour, and season six, our tomino -a -thon. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. I'm going to miss doing the Kyoto vacation. I'm sad that, you know, I have to go back to work. 
I'm, I'm legitimately sad I have to go back to work because we record these on Sunday, so I have to go in tomorrow at like 5.30 in the morning. Um, it, I love the Kyoto vacation. It was a good spiritual place to be in. But remember that we will be back next week covering Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Freedom the next time on Japan Animation Station. Japan Animation Station!